Good morning, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, we will be starting our program in five minutes. So if I can ask everyone to please find your seats. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Global Governance and Diplomacy Workshop. My name is Hei Young Yun, and I am the Managing Director of the International Cooperation and Capacity Building Department at KDI School of Public Policy and Management. It's a great pleasure and honor to have you all here today for the launch of this new program in celebration of our 25th anniversary. Today's event will take place in two sessions, one in the morning and the second one immediately following lunch this afternoon. A total of seven speakers will share their respective countries' experiences and insights on some of the most pressing global issues of today. We really appreciate their sharing of their expertise and their time with us today. Now, this event is being broadcast live on KDI School's YouTube channel with attendees from all around the world. So we would like to take this opportunity to also thank our online viewers for tuning in with us this morning. Um, lastly, before I introduce our first speaker, I would like you to note that in the back of this paper that you have in front of you is a QR code. Um, so you can uh, access some presentation materials from that QR code. And we did so in our efforts to save a few more trees if and when possible. So thank you for that. Um, now, to kick off our program, we will first be hearing from our beloved Dean of KDI School, Dean Chong Yul Yu. So please everyone, welcome Dean Yu. Your Excellencies, honored members of the diplomatic missions to Korea, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. On behalf of KDI School of Public Policy and Management, I'm deeply honored and pleased to welcome you to the Global Governance and Diplomacy Workshop, which is being held in commemoration of the school's 25th anniversary. I had the pleasure of meeting some of you at our special lecture in August, and I'm delighted to meet even more 
of our diplomatic community today. Unlike the August event that we've been holding for many years, this workshop is a new initiative that we are starting this year. Uh, we thought the school's 25th anniversary would be an auspicious time to launch this workshop on global governance and diplomacy. And judging from the turnout today, I would say we were quite right. Thank you all for joining us today, both here and online. Especially, uh, I want to thank the moderators and the speakers for the trouble they took to help with today's event. I hear that many ambassadors put in a lot of effort to prepare their presentations, and I'm very much looking forward to them. KDI School was founded when? 25 years ago, <laughs> in 1997, in response to the globalization drive of the then government of Korea, with a mission to foster global public leaders who can contribute to inclusive and sustainable development around the world. It's no wonder, therefore, that being global has been a central feature of our school. Our student body, our curriculum, and uh, more importantly, our values, uh, mindset, and outlook are all very global. This globalist spirit is well reflected in our academic programs as well as many events that we hold throughout the year, including today's. Unfortunately, these days, we are witnessing a rise of nationalism, nativism, protectionism, and other forms of small-mindedness. While paying attention to the deficiencies of the specific nature of globalization and the international order of the previous era that may have contributed to this unfortunate trend, we must strive to find and expand the common ground and promote global cooperation as much as we can. This is not only because we face threats like climate change, pandemics, and nuclear annihilation that are global in nature and therefore require global solutions, but also because our lofty goals for a better world, including SDGs, can't be achieved without global cooperation. I believe KDI School and the diplomatic community represented here share a disposition toward more rather than less international and global cooperation. We also share a commitment to sustainable development goals. That is what today's workshop is all about. Uh, we are going to listen to presentations from seven countries about how they are working towards SDGs and during discussions identify mutual challenges and opportunities for cooperation. I'm thrilled to be a part of this. And I'm eager to hear about Argentina's take on the world economic crisis from Ambassador Alfredo Carlos Pasco. Learn about Brazilian agricultural policies from Ambassador Marcia Doner Abreu. And I'm ready to be enlightened by Ambassador Federico Faila on Italy's efforts in sustainable energy transition. In the afternoon, we'll hear from Ambassador Maria Teresa Dizon de Vega about the Philippines' strategy for gender mainstreaming. Ambassador Amit Kumar will share with us how India uses big data for sustainable development. And DCM Garrett Weir from the UK will explain Britain's international investment and its shifting priorities. Lastly, Councillor uh, Adianti Sardaniri Wirayuda from Indonesia will round up the workshop by sharing key highlights from the 2022 G20 Bali Summit earlier this month. I'm thrilled that we can call on our diplomatic community to share their knowledge and insight. and grateful to have this opportunity to learn from you today. I hope we can continue this kind of workshop and create yet another tradition of sharing knowledge with the diplomatic community. Before closing, allow me to thank uh, 
our diplomatic community, for all your help during our quarter century of history. Your unwavering support has helped us identify emerging leaders from your respective parts of the world. And now, our 6,700 strong global alumni network represents 141 different countries. It's like United Nations. Coming from different parts of the world and diverse professional backgrounds, our student body is a vibrant melting pot of thought leaders and change agents. We cherish this uniqueness and are grateful to the diplomatic community in Korea for helping us maintain this remarkable global representation at KDI School. KDI School is and always will be committed to offering a top-notch educational experience, reinforcing our curriculum to reflect the demands of our time while cherishing the globalist spirit that I mentioned earlier. Once again, I wish to expand, uh, extend a heartfelt welcome and thanks to all of you for joining us for the inaugural Global Governance and Diplomacy Workshop. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dean Yu. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now move on to our very first presentation of this morning. I'm pleased to introduce Ambassador Alfredo Carlos Vasco from the Embassy of Argentina. Ambassador Vasco's diplomatic career includes postings in the UAE, Germany, Canada, and China, before serving as the Argentine ambassador to Korea since April of 2019. Today, he will talk to us about the global economy and the Argentine potential, and apparently some cricket as well, is my understanding, yes? Okay, so everybody, please welcome Ambassador Basco. Good morning. First of all, Mr. Young Ilyu, Dean of the KDA Public Policy and Management School. Dear colleagues, distinguished guests, good morning. Thank you for attending this forum. As they mentioned, my, my topic will be global economy and the Argentine potential. Yes, it's easy to talk about cricket instead of global economy. Okay, um, during the last years, we have been challenged by important issues such as climate change, COVID-19, and most recently, the war in Ukraine. These challenges are dynamic and didn't finish. We are starting to see the short, medium, and long-term effects they have and they will have over our lives. Inflation, debt, growing inequality, all combined will lead us toward less growth and food insecurity that can end up threatening the political stability within our countries. Unless we do something about it and fast. COVID-19 shows us how interconnected we are and the kind of results we get when we try to solve global threats with individual approaches. We must learn from these experiences in order to find solutions together. No one is safe until everybody is safe. Let me talk a little bit about a brief outlook about the most relevant challenges the world economy has experienced in the recent years. Inflation. The conflict between Russia and Ukraine is lowering global growth and fueling inflation around the world. Rapid economic recovery from the COVID shock also helped to unleash the largest wave of inflation we have seen since the early 80s. Recent study shows that 2022 would end at a high values of 3.9% in the advanced economy and 59 in the emerging ones. The rise in inflation responds to the increase in the price of commodities, the greater cost of maritime freight, and the misalignment in the supply chain that have 
given rise to increased logistic costs. This would lead to more restrictive monetary policies, which could affect credit for developing countries, limit the space for expansive fiscal policies, and reduce growth. Fla fighting inflation is what central banks are supposed to do. Interest ra rates are their obvious tool. But it is time to wake up to the historic significance of our current moment. Why we are fighting it country by country? If we want to keep the pain of deflation to a minimum, we urgently need international cooperation to fully take into account all the spillover effects and to prepare the safety nets. The debt. The level of global debt is at its highest level in history. According to an article published by the IMF, 2020 recorded the largest increase in debt, public and private, since World War II. During 2020, the debt increased by 28 percentage points and reached 256% of the GDP. Just to remind, the developing economies did not have the same tools to combat the COVID-19 pandemic as they faced limited access to, fund, to access to funds and higher interest rates. Inequality. Inequality continues to grow in the world, according to the World Inequality Report 2022, published by the World Inequality Lab. The pandemic widened the grow, growing inequality and increased the profits of billionaires around the world. A revealing fact that is included in the report is that during the 40 years, the last 40 years, the countries have gotten richer, but the government have become poorer. In the central countries, the wealth of the public sector is negative. That is, all the wealth is in private hands, a trend that has been reinforced during the pandemic. Since in order to face ravages caused by the virus, the government bor borrowed up to 20% of the GDP, mainly from the private sector. Growth. The global economy would grow up to 4.4% in 2022, lower than the 59 in 2021, according to IMF. This moderation in the growth rate is due to the restrictions in mobility that are imposed again and persisting limitations to find an intermediate good supply, resulting from the restrictions to transport, the scarcity of containers, and the policy of low inventories. Among other ca causes, the reduction in growth rate would be originate from the rise of commodity prices, the difficulties for transportation across conflict areas in Ukraine, the export re restrictions set by many countries to guarantee domestic supply, the transport Interrupt interruptions amid pandemic and the closure of activities in China due to the resurgence of COVID. Food security and political instability. As a result of all the challenges, we are witnessing an increase in social turmoil in the interior of countries and in political tensions between them. The world is changing fast. We are facing enormous challenges and the only way to succeed is throughout cooperation and coordination. In this context, I strongly believe that Latin America and Argentina have the potential to play a key role within the intermediate co international community that would help to overcome the current crisis. I will talk a little bit about the relations of Argentina, Latin America, and Korea. Korea, we believe, has everything to succeed in the region of Latin America. They have the knowledge, the technology, the businesses, the financial capabilities to increase the presence throughout the region. In particular, Argentina, the third economy of Latin America, is free of war and racial or religious conflicts. It has a stable institutional framework and a solid democratic system. An attractive destination for investors, thanks to its huge natural resources and competitive advantages. Among them, 
skilled workforce, workforce rich by renowned educational institutions, making it a regional leader. Abundant natural resources, agro, energy, several key minerals, and water. Wind and solar power resources. Member of the Mercosur, together with Brazil, Paraguay, and Uruguay, a market of approximately 300 million people. I would like to mention some economic sectors which I think have the potential in terms of growth between Korea and Argentina. Agro-industry. Argentina is internationally renowned, internationally renowned for its agricultural industry. With excellent climate and soil, features human capital with a long history in the industry and high acquisition of technology toward the land. We are a major player in international agricultural markets today with tremendous potential to increase productivity growth on a sustainable basis. Oil and gas. Argentina has a world-class hydrocarbon resources that place it in a significant player in the global energy markets, including an extensive unexplored offshore platform of around half a million kilometers. It is important to mention the relevant oil and gas resources in the Vaca Muerta Basin. It is the second in non-conventional gas resources and the fourth in non-conventional oil resources at a global level. Currently, a pipeline is under construction between Vaca Muerta and the port of Bahia Blanca to export all those uh, uh, resources. <clears throat> Due to its oil and gas reserves, Argentina has the potential to become a world-class energy supplier, joining the global energy markets via oil and gas exports. I believe this is one of the utmost importance due to the current situation in the global markets. Argentina has also a lot of potential in terms of its renewable resources. I would like to emphasize that we offer a large potential for low-cost hydrogen based on renewable electricity, solar and wind resources, when compared with other countries in the world. This is due to the high average wind speeds and in addition, high solar irradiation throughout large areas of the countries. Mining. Argentina has a huge territorial extension for st sustainable mining activities. 75% is st still and explore, and the capacity to, mul to multiple lith lithium, gold, silver, copper, rare earth productions. During the last decade, we have been certified as the fourth largest producer of lithium in the world after China, Australia, and Chile. It is worth to mention that Argentina, together with Chile and Bolivia, formed the so-called lithium triangle which concentrates 65% of the world resources. Possibilities, cooperation with Korea. To conclude, I think there is a lot of room for cooperation between our countries. Argentina and Korea are complementary economies, and energy, mining, and the food industry are the main fields we were, we, uh, where we can improve our cooperation and common work. Thank you very much. Kamsamida. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Our next presentation will be delivered by Ambassador Marcia Donor Abru from the Embassy of Brazil. Her foreign service career began in 1987 as she served as the ambassador to Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, Kyrgyzstan, and most recently as Secretary for Asia Pacific and Russia. She will be speaking to us about food security and sustainability. Please, everyone, welcome Ambassador Marsha Dona Abru to the podium with a big round of applause. Hello. Yes. Oh, okay. So, uh, <coughs> dear Dean Yu. Uh, dear Ambassador Choi, our moderator, that I had the pleasure of uh, meeting years ago in his capacity as Ambassador of Korea to the WTO. Uh, dear Managing Director of the uh, KDI, 
Thank you very much to the Institute and to uh, the organizers for having me here today. And without much ado, let me uh, start my presentation. Uh, it's, uh, I had a PowerPoint because I think it's always easier to speak with a, yes, to speak with some images to help uh, you follow uh, what I say. I tend to speak very quickly. Oh, as I guess everybody knows that Brazil is really big in agriculture and environment. Uh, perhaps what you don't know is how big. And uh, I share some figures with you. We uh, in Brazil produce um, around 10% of the world food. We uh, have 30% of the tropical forests in the world, the largest freshwater reserves. And we are the number one in, uh, about, in, among uh, the 18 mega diverse countries harboring around 15 to 20 percent of the world's uh, global biodiversity. We also have a very clean energy and electricity matrix and run a very successful bioethanol program for fuel. Uh, we were the first developing country to adopt CO2 emission goals in 2009, a program that uh, is still running, of course, and the are the one who most contributed to getting, removing carbon from the atmosphere, five billion tons of CO2 equivalents of farm. So uh, we are a, a real agribusiness and uh, environmental powerhouse. And in this capacity, we hope we can contribute to uh, the implementation of SDGs goals too, that is zero hunger, and sustainable agriculture, and SDG 13, that is actions to combat climate change. Uh, and we hope to be also part of the solution to the to three of the most serious and pressing challenges faced by mankind today, which are food insecurity, the uh, energy transition, and decarbonization of the economy and sustainability. Brazil is, uh, First, ranks first, second, and third among world producers uh, of a number of agribusiness products, uh, producers and exporters, I mean, uh, agribusiness products such as food, animal protein, fuel, uh, feed, and fiber. So let's see some of the figures. But before that, let me tell you that. Um, we are big producers, but we are also big consumers what, of what we ourselves produce. Uh, if you look at the graphic, Brazil consumes around internally, domestically, around 58% of what we produce in terms of agribusiness output. Uh, this is uh, comparable to the USA that, that consumes 80% of what everything they produce, and Australia that is also in the field uh, of big agricultural producers, but consumes a little less than 50%. Um, as for the numbers of our exports to the world, we, uh, no surprise, soybeans is the biggest export that we have for the world, and soybeans is basically oil for uh, food, and uh, human food, but also soybean cake for animal feed. And this is very important for countries that wish to increase their protein intake and protein production. Then we have beef, sugar, and oil. Uh, beef and sugar running second with 7% each. Oil cake, animal protein uh, rank uh, uh, an important uh, if you add up uh, beef, poultry, and pork. Fibers with cellulose and cotton and corn, of course, and then the coffee that we are so famous in the world because despite this being only 3% of our exports, it's still the biggest exporter in the world. And you have the figures in your previous graph, uh, for those of you that are uh, relying, relying on, on presentation papers. As for our export destinations, again, no surprise, China is the biggest consumer of our exports. It's uh, uh, actually 70% of the soybeans and 60% and of the beef we export into the world go to China. But all the Asian countries are very important as well. In Asia, <coughs> without surprise again, uh, consumes more than 50% of Brazilian exports 
of Brazilian agribusiness exports to the world. The EU27 comes uh, next with 15% of exports, North America with 10, and then South America, Africa, and the Middle East all tied with 6% of the total agribusiness exports of Brazil. Uh, there are a lot uh, of myths and uh, fake news, I would say, about Brazilian land use for agricultural purposes. Uh, the, the biggest one being that uh, agribusiness in Brazil is a predator of the environment and particularly of the Amazon. I wanted to bring you some solace with some figures that are very recent that show that, well, we do have problems, yes, but the situation is not at all what it has been pictured worldwide sometimes, but the very own competitors of ours. Actually, if you go to Brazilian surface, and I unfortunately do, do, do not have a map here, I should have one. Brazil is a huge country. We have 8.5 million square kilometers, which corresponds to eight, five, 85 times the size of South Korea. So uh, the preserved vegetation area in Brazil, the area that has native vegetation cover, corresponds to more than 66% of the surface. Imagine then, in comparison to your own countries, what is it to have 66% of your countries covered with native vegetation? Uh, it, in the case of Brazil, the area is bigger than the European Union 27 plus the UK all together. So where does this 66% of vegetation preserved come from? First, it comes from obvious, the conservation areas and the indigenous lands that are naturally, that are protected by law. 13% uh, in one case, 13.8% in the other case. Then it also comes from the unclaimed land and water that are obviously not uh, uh, destroyed. And finally, it comes from um, preserved agricultural areas. This is because, and I will advance and then come back a little bit with my slide. This is uh, these uh, preserved agricultural areas are actually because of the Forest Code of Brazil, a very advanced piece of legislation that imposes on agricultural owner, landowners, the obligation to conserve or restore uh, native vegetation in their rural properties. Uh, this obligation percentage, the, per the percentage of uh, the preservation obligation varies. It is of 80% in the Amazon and 20% in most of Brazil with a uh, transition zone that is the Cerrado areas in the Liga Amazon. The Liga Amazon is the area in Brazil, it's more than 60% of Brazil, where the specific legislation uh, is applicable to environmental protection and other uh, economic factors. But um, this uh, protection in, in the percentage then in this case is 35%, which means that uh, this contributes to that uh, 20.5% of uh, preserved uh, vegetation. What happens if you had already cut your vegetation? Oh, it's easy. Then you have to restore it. Then you have to recreate the native vegetation that you had. And it gives us a real interesting uh, opportunity for, I would say, carbon credits creation and international cooperation for those who want to help us to restore this, uh, these properties. And it is also the case for the productive land for agribusiness in Brazil. Of course, land is, uh, the productive uh, land is divided between crops, uh, planted forests, and pastures for cattle raising and ranching activities. Now, pastures in Brazil correspond to 18% of the territory, but actually only 8 to 9% of this pasture land is actually productive. Uh, land. Uh, the rest, 10 or 11 percent, is actually um, degraded pasture land that again can offer excellent uh, uh, ex areas for expansion of the agriculture and this is something that I will 
talk about you next, we can expand our agriculture and we can expand our forestry practices without uh, increasing areas occupied by, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, without increasing the forestation or, or, or occupation of new arable land in the country by just uh, having recourse to those 10% uh, of pastures that are degraded pastures, low productivity pastures. Uh, I had already told about uh, the forestry code, so let me talk about also our uh, low carbon agriculture programs. In, in Portuguese, it reads as a ABC, Agric Agricultura de Baixo Carbono. But uh, this low carbon agriculture is a series of practices that are extremely important for uh, reducing the emissions of carbon from land use in Brazil. Uh, you may not know that Brazil. Uh, despite being so huge, doesn't make even to the 10 top emitters of uh, CO2 or CO2 equivalent gases in the atmosphere. Uh, we uh, have 3% of the world emissions, which is relatively low for our standard of development. And 1% of these emissions or these worldwide emissions, I would say, come from land use. So uh, the low carbon agriculture program uh, that started to be implemented in 2010 to 2010 to 2012, and now we have a low carbon agriculture plus that started to be implemented last year. Uh, it relies on a series of practices that are environmentally friendly. The first one, of course, is reforestation, eh? is the, the big green forest here. The second is biological nitrogen fixation on land. Well, how we do that? We do it with bacteria. These bacteria have been found in nature and have been genetically engineered to help uh, increase nitrogen uh, fixation. And this actually is very good because nitrogen is a powerful source of uh, greenhouse gases emission. And also uh, it reduces the need for more fertilizers, which Brazil is poor on. We have to import most of our fertilizers. We also use a non-tillage system, and we are going to see a picture of it in the, my next slide. We combine harvesting and planting, so we don't have to revolve the soil uh, to planting. And with that, we also help fixating carbon in the soil. This is the picture I wanted to show you. I will come back then to my previous slide. You harvest uh, soybeans on one, on one part of the property, and immediately after, you can start planting. So you don't really need to do the, 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 the tillage practice. So coming back then, uh, I was going to talk. Then we have pasture recovery. I have already talked to you uh, about that. We can do it with tall, high grassland, but we can also do it with reforestation. Then we have manure treatment for our uh, cattle raising and ranching. Manure, as you may know, is a big emitter of CO2 or, or, or CO2 equivalent, equivalent uh, greenhouse gases, I, I would say. And then, enter because it's methane, it's not really CO2. And then the integrated crop livestock forestry systems. It's a very ingenious technique where you have uh, uh, the property occupied with three things at a time. You have some areas of forestry, you have integrated uh, pasture land, and you have crops. So this is also very good to uh, increase the efficiency of the technology toolbox of the uh, low carbon agriculture. We have already recovered, despite my slide saying 40, 49 million hectares, actually 52 million hectares in the years 2010 to 2020. And we have a bigger goal for 2020, 2030 of 72 million hectares of land recovered and uh, a number of a significant number of tons of uh, CO2 equivalent removed from the atmosphere. Uh, I also wanted to show you that we have actually been able to increase productivity of our land in a significant uh, way. Uh, for grains, where we are big, and, and, and soybeans and corn and, and even rice and wheat, we uh, have increased productivity by, I don't know if you can read it, but it's 326% in the past 30 years, whereas the land occupied with agriculture has increased by only 74%. The, uh, so it's, it's a considerable increase in productivity with far less land 
involved into it, and it's a lot due to uh, techniques and uh, uh, science and technology. I'm just going to talk about that. The same is true for for, for cattle raising. Uh, the uh, the number of heads has actually increased uh, by 50 percent, whereas the pasture land area has actually decreased by 12 percent. And uh, why this is so, and why this deficiency, and why this uh, uh, economicity, I would say, in uh, natural resources comes from? Well, first of all, it comes from science and technology. Science and technology and the Brazilian uh, enterprise for, for uh, agricultural research in Brapa have been very important in this area. Brapa has been created in the early 70s and it today has more than 42 centers dealing with all kinds of biomas in Brazil, all kinds of uh, products, doing research and uh, increasing productivity and uh, of course it shows. What did they do? They developed new plant varieties, uh, breeding improvements, cultivation techniques, the nitrogen fixation that I have already talked about, soil correction. Uh, this means that, and this means that, for instance, they, they developed early harvest soybean varieties, which represents for us the possibility of having two and even three crops in certain properties per year. So you can plant soybean and you can harvest soybean and plant maize, and then you can plant. We have two crops of maize every year, that's for sure. Uh, for soybeans, two is the norm, but we can have three. This brings, of course, reduced fixed costs for the producer because he uses the same land, the same equipment, the same labor, and he can harvest twice, three times a year. This also allows for very competitive grain production for export, of course, for domestic consumption, of course, because we are the biggest exporter of uh, animal protein in the world. This also means the possibility of big carbon sequestration because every time you you, you crop something, uh, every time you grow something, you, 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 you take carbon, you remove carbon from the atmosphere. Then I talked also about uh, energy matrix. Uh, I don't know if all of you are fam familiar with this concept, but the energy matrix means simply the combination of sources of energy that power a given system. In this case, the clean energy matrix is the the energy matrix that powers the Brazilian society and the Brazilian economy. And uh, it's uh, really, uh, I would say, clean in the sense that uh, uh, the weight of renewables, the percentage of renewables in our energy matrix, the sum of all energy sources that power Brazil, is almost 45%. This is three times the average of OECD economies as a whole. Of course, averages. Averages. I think we are going to hear from our Italian colleague uh, in uh, in a moment that they have they have plans in place and they are pretty well in this area as well. But uh, this being that uh, this being said, 55% is pretty good. Now renewables is 55%. And what are our renewables? Our renewables are sugarcane uh, products, is the bioethanol and the biomass. Firewood and charcoal, green firewood, I mean, uh, 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 wood uh, burnt, uh, hydroelectricity, and other non renewables that are very, very small. We don't count uh, nuclear as uh, renewable. Some countries do, it's a question of methodology. But then, oil, of course, natural gas, coal, and coke make the most of our non renewable uh, energy matrix. In electricity generation, our numbers are far more impressive. Of course, electricity is just part of the energy matrix of a country, uh, but in, in our case, the renewable, uh, the renewable form of energy corresponds to almost 80%, in certain years, 82% of the uh, generation of electricity in Brazil. Hydroelectricity is still the bulk of it. Uh, wind, by, but you see, wind, biomass, and solar are growing. Uh, and of course, we have then the part of the non-renewables with coal, natural gas, oil products, and a percentage of nuclear, small percentage of nuclear. This uh, clean air electricity and clean energy generation gave birth to one of the 
The most uh, enticing features of the Brazilian energy matrix these days, it, it is the bioenergy industry. Uh, bio industry uh, bioenergy industry is mostly ethanol, but it contains also a little bit of biodiesel. And uh, for the bioethanol, for fuel purposes, uh, it is a program that has been that started being developed in 1979 as a re response uh, to the oil crisis, the second oil crisis that year. Little did we know that uh, by then it was not foreseeable that the world would come into such a huge problem with the carbon intensity and the need to reduce. Uh, the carbon footprint of economies and how huge these would be for Brazil and for some countries that are following in our steps by mixing ethanol into their gasoline to start with. This was the beginning of the Brazilian program. We would mix some ethanol in the gasoline and today this percentage comes to 27% of the gasoline sold in the country. Then we developed a specific uh, car motor that we call the flex fuel motor that allows you actually to uh, uh, pump your vehicle, power your vehicle with 100% ethanol, 100% gasoline or any mix in between. So it's the gasoline that has already ethanol in it with any percentage of additional ethanol if you want to contribute to climate change or if in that specific moment ethanol price balance is more convenient and affordable for you. And these vehicles correspond to all the Brazilian fleet that comes from out of factories today. And we see that India is already starting to develop its own uh, ethanol uh, flex, sorry, flex fuel motor, which means that uh, 1.6 billion people in the world will have cars running on some mix of ethanol in some near future. Okay. Uh, also. Uh, I put some figures over there. Uh, the ethanol, bioethanol program represents 44% of replacement over gasoline in Brazil and represents 4 billion trees planted in terms of what uh, CO2 it removed or, or, or didn't launch into the atmosphere. Represents like 4 billion trees planted since 2003. We have other examples of cars that can run on ethanol. Uh, the most, uh, the most uh, I would say, easy one is the hybrid flex because it, uh, instead of gasoline for the uh, backup uh, energy, it uses ethanol. This has been developed by Toyota, is running in Brazil in a, in a prototype phase. The other most exciting, I would say, is the e-biofuel cell where it's a hydrogen-powered car where the hydrogen comes straight from breaking up molecules of ethanol inside the car. So the car is powered by ethanol, but the ethanol, there, there is a converser inside the car that breaks the ethanol and produces six molecules of hydrogen, whereas the common electrolysis produces only two. As you know, H2O uh, is the formula for water. So now, uh, last week, and I couldn't uh, in include it in the slide because it's, it was already here. Last week, we introduced, we, I, I heard, I, I read about a, pro uh, a program by Volkswagen that is developing an entry car, so an economic model, for Europe, India, and Brazil uh, that will run on two motors. One is electrical, and the other one may be ethanol or gasoline. So it's a, it's a very exciting new perspective. And for a country like Korea that has a world-class auto industry, this might be a possibility to follow. Like we say, uh, the end of the combustion motor is not really in the cards if you think about a huge part of the, of the humanity that cannot immediately go electric because it's very expensive to transform and adapt the, the infrastructure. So what else I have here? Uh, I have some current challenges to our agriculture sustainable agricultural production, various quotas, tariffs, technical barriers, sanitary and phytosanitary measures, environmental, social, and ethic to uh, which we believe we can reply with our, uh, the sustainability of our uh, production, and also the disorganization on, in the world trade of fertilizers that uh, has to come back to normalcy 
where, uh, or else condemn a huge portion of mankind to hunger because of difficulties to uh, cultivate. And then the future challenges, of course, that the world will have more people. We, turn, we just turned 8 billion two weeks ago. Now, 3.2 billion people, more, more 3.2 billion people expected in 2050, needing 70% more food, growing population, rising income, more food, more feed, more fibers, more bioenergy. And according to the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, 40% of this growth will come from Brazil. Of course, the other big challenge is climate change that will put agriculture under a heavy, heavy stress. We are already seeing it. Changes in rain uh, patterns, increases in temperature. Uh, this is extreme weather events that are becoming more and more common and they are very scary. This is very scary. We just saw happened to Pakistan uh, a month ago. And finally, water scarcity, and I think uh, this brings me to the end of my presentation. I hope uh, I will be glad to take your questions, and I hope that I answered at least some of your curiosity about uh, SDGs 2 and 13 in Brazil. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Now we will be moving on to our next speaker for this morning session, Ambassador Federico Failla from the Embassy of Italy, Plenipotentiary Minister since 2009. He served as the Ambassador of Italy to Indonesia and East Timor and worked as the Coordinator for Energy Issues as Directorate General for Globalization at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation. And he has been uh, the ambassador to Korea since January of 2019. An expert and enthusiast on energy issues, he will be speaking to us today on Italy's policies on sustainable energy and uh, sustainable energy transition. So everyone, please welcome Ambassador Failia. Good morning to everyone. Good morning, Dean of KDI School and colleagues and uh, distinguished guests. Maybe I'm an enthusiast, for sure I'm not an expert on energy issues, not a, a real expert. I've learned something during my uh, um, professional career. Uh, but I think that, of course, energy and foreign policy are strictly connected to each other. Actually, is one of the engine of foreign policies, uh, uh, the energy issues. Uh, first of all, let me thank, of course, KDI for inviting me today and uh, congratulations for the 25th anniversary of the school. Uh, you know, just recently, to get into the issue, just recently, uh, there's been COP27. It's been a, a very important event and uh, uh, talking about COP27, well, it's, uh, um, of course, it's not an easy task. Uh, um, so my presentation will be, you will find here the outline. Uh, first, I will uh, focus on global scenario between energy crisis and climate goals, and then Italy stands in the international climate negotiations, and then uh, uh, Italy domestic policies. Uh, so about global scenario. You know that the global debate uh, on climate change, energy transition, just to, uh, to have a small recap, uh, at a key turning point with the Paris Agreement in 2015. Uh, the target was to, to uh, contain global warming, increase well below two uh, degrees Celsius compared to the pre-industrial era. Uh, well, in uh, COP26 in Glasgow uh, last year, co-chaired by UK and Italy, uh, the agreement was to keep alive the goal of containing global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Uh, COP27, uh, well, this uh, uh, commitment were uh, reaffirmed um, uh, and, uh, well, it's and not a difficult, not an easy task to, to achieve. Uh, but on the other side, now uh, um, renewable sources are much more 
um, uh, competitive compared to fossil fuels. Uh, but the global scenario, of course, there is a problem in uh, energy commodity pr price growth. Uh, there was al already an underlying trend about the growth, but the Russian Federation's aggression to Ukraine has exacerbated the trend. Uh, just to give you uh, some numbers, in February 2022, Italy was importing 45% of its total gas from Russia. In November 22, we imported just 9%, and uh, we uh, hope to, to, to uh, arrive to zero very soon. This means it's not only, of course, uh, Italy, but also other countries. This means that there is increased competition on the global market. So it means there is an, um, uh, rise, uh, the, um, uh, the price are uh, raising, and also the shipping costs are raising. Uh, of course, it's important to speed up the diversification of suppliers. These are huge challenges, but Italy is, stays at the forefront in the global climate agenda, um, also as a part of EU common climate policy. Uh, and uh, we are really want to achieve ambitious targets in terms of uh, mitigation, adaptation, and climate finance. So, Italy international stance in terms of mitigation. Uh, well, we are committed to meet the new ambitious targets announced at COP27 by EU. Minus 50% emissions by 2030 uh, announced by the Vice President uh, of the Commission, Franz Timmermans, and climate neutrality by 2050. Uh, in order to accelerate the process of decarbonization, the European Commission is now proposing to further increase the 2030 target for renewable energies from 40% to 45% as a part of the Fit for 55 package. Uh, I wish to recall that also in May 2022, the European Commission presented the Repower EU package, which includes several measures to free the EU from dependence on Russian fossil fuels by 2027, accelerating the production of hydrogen, uh, specifically 10 million tons of domestic renewable hydrogen and 10 million tons of import by 2030, to replace natural gas, coal and oil uh, in industries that are difficult de to decarbonize. Uh, in terms always of uh, uh, um, adaptation, uh, Italy is one of the few developed countries which has always guaranteed the balance between mitigation and adaptation in its global finance efforts. For instance, in 2020, 56 of our overall climate finance was devoted to adaptation measures and the remaining 44. Uh, went towards mitigation. Uh, just at COP27, the 8th of November, in Sharm el Sheikh, the Italian government has officially launched the Italian Climate Fund. This is the first Italian fund with a budget of 840 million euros per year for five years, specifically dedicated to the de development of clean technologies and to adaptation to climate change in developing countries. In terms of climate finance, uh, our Prime Minister announced at the uh, COP27, uh, uh, together with other world uh, uh, leaders, um, uh, to, uh, um, the commitment to deliver on 100 billion USD pledge to support developing countries through 2025, and to define an ambitious and sustainable target thereafter. Uh, we have almost tripled our financial commitment up to $1.4 billion per year for the next five years. In addition, COP27, Italy also announced its contribution of a total of 250 million euros to the Just Energy Transition Partnership, together with Indonesia, uh, an initiative aimed at providing substantial financial resources and technical assistance to partner countries. 
We don't have to forget also the part about loss and damages. Uh, financing the damage and losses already suffered by the most vulnerable countries due to extreme events triggered by climate change. Uh, at COP27, Italy and the EU strongly supported the establishment of the first ever fund for loss and damages that uh, whose functioning should be defined by uh, COP28. Uh, as for the it Italy's domestic climate and energy policies, uh, well, uh, Italy is among the most advanced countries in the world in decarbonization and fight against climate change. Uh, well, we don't have the number of Brazil. Uh, in our energy mix, uh, natural gas accounts for 42%, oil 34%, Green energy is 20 and coal only 4%. Uh, while while the, the uh, uh, electricity said 40% uh, of ele electrical power is generated by renewable sources. Um, uh, we have reduced drastically, as I said before, uh, our dependence of gas from Russia. Um, uh, and uh, as for other aspects, Italy is the first EU country for recy recycled waste, the first country in circular, in circular economy. Uh, for instance, uh, since 2010, we banned plastic bags, um, uh, and uh, of course, this has brought to a decrease in the use of disposable bags. Um, it's the fifth country in the world for energy efficiency. It's the second country in the EU for renewable energy production. Uh, Nowadays, Italy is in the midst of the implementation of the largest investment plan after World War II. Um, in, uh, after COVID, uh, uh, the EU uh, decided to um, uh, implement, to, to, to uh, establish a plan called Next Generation EU as a, a response to the unprecedented crisis that we were experiencing. And uh, uh, thanks to this plan, Italy is now investing 235 billion euros from 2021 to 2026, so-called National Recovery and Resilience Plan. Um, there are six pillars, digitization, innovation, competitiveness, culture and tourism, green revolution and ecological transition, infrastructure for sustainable mobility, education and research, social inclusion, health, all of them underlying there is the problem of energy transition. Uh, well, while one uh, uh, pillar is focusing specifically on green revolution, uh, um, uh, of course, also digitization or infrastructure education, basically they are focusing also very much on the process of the ecological transition. Uh, this means also that we are implementing very uh, deep reforms in our system, uh, uh, legislative system, in the regulation reforms, and uh, trying to simplify also the judicial tax system. One thing uh, has been clear um, um, during our experience dealing with uh, uh, ecological transition. Uh, renewable, uh, uh, let's say the en en energy mix, uh, the renewable uh, uh, energy uh, production works only if there is a proper regulatory framework. This means, in our case, that uh, production and distribution uh, um, uh, producers, companies are separated by the owners of the grid. Uh, they cannot bundle together, so-called unbundling. Uh, that there are many independent producers, even private producers. And most important, there is an independent authority for energy. That is a kind of referee. Uh, um, the, so the, the decisions, the, the final decision is not left to the government, but there is an independent uh, authority that can regulate the market. Uh, the second pillar, the one that is called Green Revolution Eco Ecological Transition, uh, well, the uh, 69 billion euros will be dedicated to this pillar. Uh, this means one of the largest share, of course, of the, the, the total investment plan, because this is 
the real most important point. Uh, the pillar two has a holistic approach, uh, circular economy, recycling, waste reduction, renewable energy, uh, hydrogen, improvement of the electrical and water infrastructure, improvement of energy efficiency, which is a very important point. Uh, um, uh, saving energy means really helping the planet. It's one of the probably one of the greenest source. Saving energy means that uh, companies should use companies should use less energy. They should be more efficient. So the price of the energy cannot be too low uh, uh, because otherwise this does not help. Uh, uh, this transition to, 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 to a green economy. Um, and of course also uh, uh, the efficiency in the real estate sector, um, also sustainable agriculture and uh, uh, mobility. Uh, one thing I want to stress, uh, this investment uh, uh, plan is uh, uh, thought basically on a kind of model of PPP, public-private partnership. Um, uh, and it's open to any company. It's not only limited to Italian or European companies. Any company can invest in Italy uh, uh, according to the um, uh, directives and the guidelines of the plan. So can benefit from uh, tax incentives and that other forms that the plan foresees. Uh, also, in the pillar two, 23.8 billion are dedicated to uh, renewable energy, hydrogen grids, and sustainable uh, mobility. We have a hydrogen project, uh, almost 4 billion euro, uh, that should provide support to hydrogen production, distribution, research, use in industry, and transport. Uh, the incentives to use hydrogen in uh, some sectors that are quite difficult to decarbonize, like steel, refining, chemicals. Uh, in uh, uh, also building 10 hydrogen valleys, uh, also uh, with the reconversion of the commissioned industrial areas. And then also a renewable project with uh, almost 6 billion euros dedicated to agrivoltaic systems, a self-production in a rural areas offshore wind power generation. Uh, as for sustainable mobility, eight and a half billion are dedicated to this uh, project, uh, to this sector. Uh, there is uh, the renewal of uh, the bus fleet for local transport, electric charging station in the motorways and urban areas, bike lanes, uh, rapid mass transport in urban areas, and the smart grid project. Uh, this is another very important part. Smart grids are the future. Without smart grids, every effort yeah, I don't want to say it's doomed to fail, but it will be more difficult to, to succeed. Um, it, the point is to increase the grid capa capacity to host and integrate additional distributed generation from renewable sources and to strengthen the electrification of energy consumption. When you have many independent producers, grid is the key. I want to again stress this point. Um, so, um, uh, one, uh, as I said before, one important part is the energy efficiency, efficiency and renovation of buildings. So for this reason, more than 15 billion euros are devoted to this, uh, to this chapter. Um, uh, there are tax incentives to increase the energy efficiency of private and public buildings. Um, and, uh, for instance, uh, um, uh, in order to uh, save, uh, the, 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 um, uh, the target is to save six, 667 ketones CO2 per year. More than 5 billion are dedicated to circular economy and the sustainable agriculture. 55% uh, of recycling electrical waste and uh, electronic equipment, these are the target. 85% recycling paper and cardboard industry, 65% recycling of plastic waste, 100% reuse in textile industry through textile hubs. Uh, finally, in these days we are seeing that all the 
land and the territories are suffering from the effect of climate change uh, in many parts of the world, including Europe, including Italy. Uh, people are literally uh, the victims of uh, um, poor uh, land management of the past and not attention to, to, to the climate change effects. So 15 billion euros are dedicated to protection of land and water resources um, for projects in strengthening national capacity of disaster risk monitoring reduction uh, um, uh, in, this, in this risk, hydrogeological and flooding risk management, water distribution modernization, and blue economy. So in conclusion, uh, Italian government is uh, uh, committed to a huge, huge effort. This effort is, of course, uh, uh, not painless, um, uh, but we are confident that this is the only possible way. Uh, we are not alone, we are part of the uh, EU, uh, um, European Union, uh, and also the partner countries are on the same line. So uh, we are confident that we can succeed in this endeavor. So I, I wish to thank you very much for your attention and thank you again for inviting me today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Now, if you would just bear with us while we rearrange the stage very quickly and we'll invite back up our three uh, speakers from this morning so we can uh, go into a nice discussion with them. Okay, thank you very much. So we'd like to resume our discussion session. Let me uh, introduce the moderator for session one. Mr. Gyeonglim Che has served as the G20 Sherpa of Korea from 2017 to 2021. He's also served as the permanent mission of Korea in Geneva from 2015 to 2018 and was president of the United Nations Human Rights Council in 2016. He's also been instrumental in helping KDI School prepare for this entire program, so we are very much indebted to him and would like to say thank you. Um, and with that, please um, welcome our moderator for this morning's session. Thank you. Morning, uh, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dean you and distinguished members of the diplomatic community. Uh, it is a, a great pleasure and honor for me to moderate this morning's session. Um, I think uh, we were very fortunate to have uh, three distinguished ambassadors uh, as uh, speakers for the morning session, each representing very important members of the international community, uh, Argentina, Brazil, and Italy. And I think uh, uh, all of the speakers made an excellent presentation on some very important issues <coughs> regarding the global challenges that uh, we face today. Um, 
in the interest of time, I shouldn't try to summarize their presentations, but um, let me just say that um, uh, Ambassador Basco of Argentina made a wonderful and concise presentation on the uh, challenges of uh, the global economy and also the uh, positive role that Argentina can play in meeting these challenges. Ambassador Abreu uh, made an uh, uh, inspiring presentation on Brazil as an agricultural powerhouse and how Brazil's agriculture can help us uh, promote the cause of food security and sustainability. And finally, Ambassador Faila of Italy made an uh, excellent presentation on Italy's effort for sustainable energy transition, which is, I think, uh, among the key challenges facing the humankind today. So uh, I thank them for the excellent presentation, each uh, rich in substance, but also very well organized. And I was also very much impressed that uh, all three speakers more or less finished their uh, presentation in the uh, time limit they were given, which is not what we see too often in this kind of seminar and workshops. So thank you very much. Um, we do not have uh, too much time for discussion until we start lunch. Um, so I would appreciate if uh, uh, the persons uh, who want to ask questions and also the speakers uh, could be as precise as possible in their questions and answers. I have uh, uh, three professors of KDI school, uh, each uh, wanting to ask uh, on the uh, three presentations. So uh, I will first ask uh, Professor Yi Jin Su of KDI uh, to ask a question on the first presentation of Ambassador Basco. Professor Kim? Uh, Professor Lee, please. Uh, thank you, and uh, it was a wonderful presentation. Uh, we know that uh, we have a, a very uh, 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 difficult period, uh, such as a war in Ukraine, and uh, uh, the, uh, the also we have a, a climate crisis, uh, change crisis, and uh, uh, also we have food problem uh, globally. So, uh, so I wonder uh, whether there is a, a some kind of trade-off between the efficiency or growth, uh, on the other, uh, sustainability. We, ha we need to both. Uh, we need to uh, have uh, 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 the high growth, also uh, productivity, efficiency, in order to feed more people. On the other hand, in order to meet the challenge in a climate crisis, we need to have uh, sustainability and uh, renewable energy. So what's your view? Uh, on the trade-off between the efficiency uh, uh, and trade-off uh, uh, and uh, uh, the sustainability. Is there any trade-off? Or if there is any, uh, can we uh, deal with uh, such trade-off? Uh, uh, how can you meet both goals, uh, the, the, uh, the growth and sustainability? Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, next, I have uh, Professor Murfeld of KDI uh, who wants to ask a question on the presentation of uh, Ambassador Abreu. He is, uh, I, I believe, connected on, online with us. So, Professor Abreu, please. Can you guys uh, hear me? Professor Murfeld, sorry. Thanks. Um, I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person, but I'm afraid I uh, have an obligation in Sejong this afternoon. Um, I have two questions, one a bit more serious and one a bit more lighthearted. Um, but on the serious one, uh, when I think Brazil and agriculture, one of the first things I think about is um, uh, the Amazon. Uh, and you mentioned a little bit about reforestation and deforestation, but I was hoping you could just say a little bit more detail about some of the specific policies the government um, has been uh, implementing over the last decade or so uh, to combat that. And then the second, um, and with apologies to Ambassador Faila, 
Uh, who do you all expect to win the World Cup? Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next, we have uh, uh, Professor Kim Youngje of KDI, who wants to uh, ask a question on the presentation by Ambassador Faila. Okay, so, uh, can you hear me? This is Youngjae, mm -hmm. and a is a. I have one quick question about a the. What are the other? I mean the. I it was good to hear about the a positive side of the Italians international and domestic national a efforts for a decarbonization. But what are the challenges of the a the further doing much better on this a area? So based on my, I used to live in Italy. So based on my personal experience in Italy, there's many many a different rules. So a some of the rules are go against with each other. So it's not always easy to understand what you have to do to get a rebate, for example, like solar panels and excess subsidies and other many other things. So do you think? Do you think is there any other a challenges ahead of Italy? To doing a much better job compared to the other European countries and rest of the world. Thank, thank you very much. Um, we had uh, uh, Professor Lee of KDI um, asking questions regarding the possible trade-off between efficiency and sus um, sustainability. Uh, that question was uh, for Ambassador Basco. And we also had uh, uh, questions from Professor Murphy, um, who asked uh, uh, what kind of diplomacy uh, we need to convince de developed countries to fulfill their obligation to climate finance directed at Ambassador Abro. And um, uh, we also had Professor Kim uh, uh, asking uh, Ambassador Faila, uh, what uh, Italy can do do better uh, in uh, acting for the cause of uh, uh, sustainable energy transition. And of course, we had uh, one more question for Ambassador Faila regarding the possible winner for the World Cup. So <laughs> I will give first uh, the floor to Ambassador Basco, please. Yes, so the, the question was the trade-off between sustainability and efficiency. Is there any, any trade-off between them? I am asking, is there any trade-off? Is possible any trade-off be, between them? Uh, maybe a trade-off. Uh, uh, for example, uh, if you want to uh, uh, make uh, investment in renewable energy, or you may have less investment in the uh, energy uh, uh, we are now have. In the case, in the future, uh, we may uh, not have such trade off, but uh, currently uh, we may have uh, some kind of trade between uh, investment in renewable energy and the investment in uh, some kind of oil and other uh, sectors. So I wonder whether uh, 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 there is, uh, 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 you have such opinion, uh, and uh, if not, or uh, if uh, there is or there is not trade off. I don't believe. Uh, you don't believe? No. I see. I see. <laughs> thank you. Very, thank you very much. That was a very concise answer. So then I will give the floor to Ambassador Abreu. Well, uh, I'm Hello, uh, I'm addressing a professor whose name I can't remember. But uh, anyway, it's an interesting question, of course. I regret that I do not have the numbers with me. But uh, actually, the history of deforestation in Brazil goes as follows. We had a very, very impressive deforestation rate in the beginning of the years uh, 2000. Uh, it started going down at that point. It corresponded uh, to the first Lula administration. You know that we have just elected a new president 
President Lula da Silva, and he came in with a very strong environmental uh, agenda on uh, to his first term as president, and he came in with uh, a, a minister of environment that is a real icon in the world environmental community, who is senator and then uh, non-senator Marina da Silva. She was also a candidate for presidential elec elections in the past. And she actually, in her policies, acted in, in terms of reducing deforestation. But as I explained to you, uh, first, the Amazon is real, real huge. The, the legal Amazon, where the specific policies for environmental protection and economic activity in the Amazon region are applicable, is more or less 60% of the Brazilian territory. So it's a huge area. It's an area of uh, 5 million square kilometers, more or less. Then uh, the second thing is, of course, this uh, politics reduced deforestation in the Amazon, but the Amazon is not the agricultural region of Brazil, please. It's basic geography. The, ba the agricultural regions of Brazil are the southern part, the central western part of Brazil, and then, of course, the northeastern region of Brazil, uh, and, uh, and this combines and this region is not the Amazon forest. Now, there are inroads, yes, when the uh, central western frontier of Brazil meets the buffer zones of the Cerrados, uh, they go into the Amazon forest. And this region has been subject to increased pressure in recent years, starting at around perhaps 2013, but increasing in 2016. So the rates of deforestation have actually increased recently. Uh, the total deforestation is nonetheless, mod, uh, deforestation rate, I would say, uh, is nonetheless nothing near what it was in the beginning of the 2000s. And I recommend, or I can recommend, that people that are curious about that can come to our embassy in Seoul and we'll be happy to give you uh, references for reading. Besides, we also have what I uh, expected to have presented in, 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 my, in my contribution to this workshop, the obligation to renew forest cover that uh, has been lost or to restore native vegetation in, proper, in rural properties, even if the, they are in the fringe of the Amazon. So, uh, again, uh, uh, to the moderator and to the assistants, I do not have the clear numbers with me, but what I know is that President Lula da Silva will be back in power in uh, more or less a month, on the 1st of January 2023. What I know is that he went to COP27 and he made a number of commitments there. It was a, uh, a, a participation, let's say, as uh, president-elect of Brazil, but he was invited by many important people. He was invited by the Secretary General of the United Nations. He was invited by the Egyptian president that was presiding over the COP. And he was also invited by a number of governors in Brazilian Amazon region, so is the Amazon consortium or group of governors in the Amazon region. He made a clear pledge of zero deforestation in Brazil in 2030. And he also made a clear pledge for uh, combating climate change. And I think, obviously, you can look at the past as an inspiration for the future, for what we did well, in the initial years of the 2000s, and for what we did not so well in the last years of uh, the 2020s, but we can and will be in a position of contributing significantly to not only loss of deforestation or loss of the Amazon, but also to climate sustainability, also to uh, food security. This is a combination, as uh, Ambassador Vasco just said, there is no such thing as a trade-off. Sustainable development is sustainable development. It has to be sustainable in the economic front, in the social front, and the, on the environmental front. Uh, and uh, quoting our 
dean of the KDI today, uh, the, 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 the only chance is to cooperate to get there. And the only chance is to harness the political will to get there. Thank you. Thank you very much. And indeed, I think uh, the efforts of the Brazilian government, as well as uh, the support of the international society for the preserv preservation of Amazon, uh, works as the best example of uh, uh, climate finance. Thank you. And um, now I give the floor to Ambassador uh, Faila of Italy, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, of course, the question was uh, uh, an excellent question. Uh, you know, uh, renewable energy is, um, uh, um, uh, is a process. I mean, uh, there are there are uh, there have been so many progresses in uh, these years that sometimes uh, some laws can seem to contradict each other. This, I think, is a normal part of uh, of uh, uh, a process that is going. Uh, very fast. As I said in my presentation, one of the efforts of the Italian government in this regard is to simplify and to uh, uh, make a regulatory framework that is uh, uh, easier to understand and especially easier to uh, easy to implement. So, uh, um, uh, of course, we want to improve. Uh, for instance, we are the second country in the EU for renewable energy production, so we might become the first. Uh, so it's uh, it's um, uh, it's something that is well clear to us. I must say that we have uh, we have uh, uh, reached some results, but of course we can in always improve. Um, as for the second question, if I knew who could win the World Cup, well, I will yeah. think. I will you think. Can. I will think to to to. to to go and to a bookmaker to and try to, <laughs> better to talk about renewable energy. Yeah, yeah, better to talk about it. renewable energy. <laughs> cannot cannot take any side here. It's quite quite complicated. Uh, <laughs> as if uh, <laughs> if I may, as uh, 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 as you said, energy enthusiasts uh, also add a word about the trade-off. Uh, I agree with my colleagues. There is no trade-off. We don't have to. Uh, invest in renewable energies because we feel good or it's uh, a good thing to do. It's a good thing to do and uh, this can make us feel good. But it, because we are no alternative, the, the trade-off is no alternative because if I think to my son and hopefully one day to my grandson, which planet we will leave to them? I think we have already spoiled enough for them. So uh, uh, there is no trade-off. Second thing, Talking about uh, uh, the cost, the cost in, uh, for renewable now is very competitive compared to the traditional uh, oil and gas, especially depends on which area. If you go to areas in which there are really a lack of energy, where there is no electrical energy almost at all or very, very short supply, it's much easier, and much more convenient. Uh, much cheaper to invest in renewables more than oil and gas. And you will create also more jobs. So according to some estimate, uh, uh, a, a, a renewable energy uh, farm creates three times more jobs than an oil and gas uh, uh, plant. One more thing about nuclear, since it's one of the... So, about nuclear. First of all, Italy has zero nuclear. We gave up nuclear in 1987. Uh, we don't have any idea to resume nuclear. Well, uh, nuclear became uh, um, commercial in 1954. And so far, they have been installed less than 400 gigawatt of uh, uh, nuclear power in the world. Mm -hmm. Less than 400 gigawatt. Whoa. For renewables that has been commercially viable since 10 years or something, we are already more than 3,000. Uh, last year, uh, uh, um, seven gigawatt of nuclear power were added to the total in the whole world. 257 gigawatt of uh, uh, renewable energy. To build a nuclear uh, power plant takes eight to ten years. To build a solar farm, three to four years. Uh, one gigawatt of nuclear power to build 
uh, costs around 5 billion, costs less than 2 billion to build in one gigawatt of renewable energy. So I, free, I think it's much more competitive. Then if we want to talk about the need to diversify and to have different supply, this is correct. I agree. So, so this is another story. About competitiveness, I think that already renewable energy is competitive today. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> it's already 12.05, but I think uh, uh, we will try to entertain one or two questions from the floor. So, Dean, you please. It's the uh, <laughs> diplomatic uh, part of come, come here. maybe. Huh? <laughs> if I speak. I think this will work. Yes, it will. Okay. Um, and s maybe slightly undiplomatically, I will ask uh, uh, the Fila uh, about uh, the Italian situation. I was pleasantly surprised, to be honest, by uh, how committed Italy uh, has been for energy transition and how much progress it has made, and also uh, Italy's stance in international climate negotiations, uh, very impressive uh, uh, support for loss and damage and all this uh, you know, uh, support for uh, just transition and, and all this. And uh, I was just wondering, uh, there's been a, uh, a change of government recently, and the, uh, uh, the, uh, those of us uh, who are a little uh, where this government is, whether uh, this direction is going to be sustained uh, in the new government uh, is uh, s my, my question to you. Thank you, thank you for your excellent, excellent question. Uh, the answer is short, yes. Uh, because, uh, you know, um, energy transition and um, uh, fight against climate change uh, is something that is not uh, uh, party politics. Uh, it's uh, bipartisan. It's something that uh, we uh, uh, believe that uh, must be uh, reached at any cost. Uh, Prime, the new Prime Minister, Prime Minister Giorgia Meloni, uh, was a charme sheikh, and uh, she reaffirmed the Italian commitment there. She supported the, the uh, um, uh, loss and, and damage and uh, the new uh, commitment for, for um, helping developing countries in the transition. So uh, according to the official policies, yes, uh, there is no change. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm sure that um, uh, there will be many who want to ask questions about presentations, but um, it's already uh, 10 past 12. So I'm afraid that uh, we have to finish our session here. But, but before we go to our lunch, let's uh, give a big hand to the present, uh, speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you to our speakers and also to our moderator. I do have one announcement for... Okay, those of you who are... I have a very loud voice, so I don't need a mic. Those of you who are sitting without a table...
people in front of you, we apologize, but we did have an overwhelming response to today's event. Please go out to the registration desk and our staff will guide you to where you can have lunch uh, in a comfortable way. Okay, the rest of you can sit where you are and enjoy lunch. We will commence our second afternoon session at 2 p.m. So please come back for our afternoon session. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry, 1, 1 p.m. Excuse me, 1 p.m. All right, thank you very much.
our second session in about five minutes. So if you could please take your seats, we'd appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back uh, for the second session of the Global Governance and Diplomacy Workshop. We hope you enjoyed your lunch and you have your coffees for this afternoon. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce to you the first speaker of our afternoon session, Juris Doctor and Ambassador Maria Teresa Dizon de Vega from the Embassy of the Philippines. She served as the Ambassador to Korea since July 2021. Her missions abroad include Germany, the United States, and the UK, and she was the chief coordinator of the Office of the Secretary of Foreign Affairs in the Philippines. Today, she will speak to us about gender equality and mainstreaming, mainstreaming issues, focusing on lessons from the Philippine government. Everyone, please help me in welcoming Ambassador Maria Teresa Dizon de Vega. Let me hold on. Oh, it's working this time. Dean, it's working. Um, first of all, a very pleasant um, afternoon to everyone. Anong asim ni kachon ng Pilipin desa Teresa de Vega imnida pangkap sumida. Don't get too excited. Chon ng hango guru chukum ham nida chukum chukum just a little just a little Korean. Uh, but first of all. Um, Deepest appreciation to um, Dean uh, jong Liu and his entire team at KDI for this very gracious invitation to share a bit about um, gender mainstreaming issues in the Philippines, uh, which hopefully will feed into the general conversation about issues on gender equality, 
um, gender mainstreaming and governance and also um, on the um, attainment of uh, SDG number five on um, gender equality and other gender related topics. Um, and um, also a pleasant afternoon to my um, fellow panelists and um, all the excellencies from the diplomatic corps who are here today and um, the students from KDI. So um, going into, um, before I go into the Philippine experience in terms of gender mainstreaming and, and governance response, I'd just like to give you a snapshot of what has happened or what's been happening to the gender equality um, conversation, the gender equality universe since the pandemic. Um, we've made great strides in terms of gender equality, although SDG number five is still um, one of the um, SDG um, goals which has been among the slowest in terms of uh, really achieving that goal, really meeting the targets. Um, unfortunately, the pandemic has set that particular goal back um, uh, for, for several years. Um, in the World Economic Forum's Global Gender Gap Report of 2021, you will see that um, there's a setback of at least 39 years for closing the gender gap. That's nearly four decades. So that's a very critical thing to keep in mind. In particular, healthcare access for women and girls were disrupted with an average of nearly four months disruption or lack of access to basic um, health services at a time with about 115 low and middle income countries per the UNDP, triple the amount, and there was also triple the amount of maternal deaths com comparing the 2019 and the 2020 to 2021 periods. Um, in a systematic review conducted by The Lancet, which of course is the leading medical publication, there were 40 case studies on maternal and perinatal outcomes, and it concluded that there has been a significant increase in stillbirths, maternal deaths, and maternal depression during the pandemic. Confinement measures during the pandemic um, across many countries also contributed to the increase in gender-based violence. Once again, the UNDP data shows an alarming number of 243 million women and girls suffering um, from physical or sexual abuse and violence since 2020. And of course, aside from the health and the domestic violence issues, the pandemic also um, limited the ability of women and girls to exercise rights and freedom, including access to education. And on the labor market, on the labor side, um, women and girls in the labor market were also likewise severely hampered. And um, these, but these issues are not new issues. They did not um, arise just from the pandemic, from the recent pandemic, but also from similar major international disease outbreaks such as the Ebola epidemic a few years back. And so we see here the need to learn some lessons, um, namely to give a greater focus and voice to women and girls in the recovery process. And we, we are now in the midst of the recovery process. Um, and many of um, the students at KDI, for example, and many of the researchers, um, you are, I think at least some of you may be involved in post-pandemic recovery programs or entry programs. And this is probably something that you may want to keep in mind. Recognize and normalize access to women's health services during outbreaks and crises as advocated by the WHO, continue to enlighten and shift mindsets on gender responsiveness and find ways for continuing education for girls and women through innovative platforms. And this is um, to give you a snapshot of um, the Philippines gender responsive governance, or at least the efforts that we've made through the years in institutionalizing gender responsive governance, governance because as we've seen from the pandemic, if um, there are no uh, very strong institutional um, support systems and a governance system in place for women and girls, then the setback of 39 years, several decades, will likely be a cyclical thing, and that's what we want to avoid. Um, our position, the Philippine position on gender and women's rights is relatively developed compared to other Asia Pacific countries. We currently rank 19th in the world overall um, in the, um, the GGI, the GGI or the gender, the 
the GGGI, the Global Gender Gap Index, um, that's the second highest ranking in the entire Asia Pacific region after New Zealand. Admittedly, we've sort of slipped. We were once in the top 10, but we've slipped to um, 19th place to the to the second um, to the second group, um, mainly because of um, some setbacks in political representation. Our closing the gender gap score for 2022 was at 0.783. And in 2021, we were at 0.782, just a difference of 0.001%, but enough to bring us two, um, two ranks down um, in the um, GGGI um, ranking. So despite, it only shows that despite the progress made, there is still a lot of room for development, especially for women on the margins of society, who are the most vulnerable, who are facing poverty, abuse, um, financial instability, who are trafficked, who do not receive um, education, or who are undereducated and exploited. And um, just to give you an idea, in terms of political representation, we actually legalized voting for women um, in 1937, so nearly 100 years ago. Um, but we still have quite a long ways to go. In terms of political representation in the Philippines, um, we've had women leaders, one of the few um, countries in the Asia-Pacific region, and overall, I would say, in the world, where... The, the political representation um, in terms of women has really risen over the years. We've had, um, we've had two women presidents. One, a very familiar figure, Corazon C. Aquino, who passed away already, was our 11th president and the first woman president of the Philippines. Gloria Macapagal-Arroyo was our 14th president, uh, second woman president, um, and the first woman vice president of the Philippines, uh, was a senator, is now a member of our National Assembly. Um, our... 14th vice president was also um, a woman, Maria Leonor Robredo, and she was um, also rose through the ranks, um, so to speak, politically. And our current vice president, the 15th vice president of the Philippines, is another woman, Sara Duterte, and she is the youngest vice president elected in the country. She's 43 years old currently, and she's also concurrently serving as the minister or the Secretary for Education in the Philippines. So a, lot's, uh, a lot is riding on her shoulders now in terms of really integrating gender equality and gender responsiveness in the education system. Now, in terms of the Philippines' own um, gender governance, um, really at the heart of it is the legislative um, is, is the legislative foundation for gender responsive uh, governance in the Philippines. Our overall or overarching law on gender, um, on gender responsive governance is the Magna Carta for Women, or the MCW. Um, it's a Republic Act which was um, passed in 2009, so um, it's more than a decade old now. It's a landmark uh, legislation which aims to bridge the gender gap and create a more responsive society in the Philippines. It's a very comprehensive law. Um, actually, I was privileged to, to sit um, as part of a technical working group for um, one of several um, sections, major sections in the law. And it was a very long drawn out um, process, um, subject to many debates and many discussions over the years before it was finally passed um, in 2009. Um, it seeks to eliminate discrimination through recognition, protection, fulfillment, pr and promotion of rights. Um, it is um, the Philipp part of the Philipp co uh, Philippines' commitment um, under the UN Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Dis Discrimination Against Women, or CEDAW. Um, the, it aims to increase the number of women in third-level positions in government. This is bureau, at the bureau director level to a 50-50 ratio. We haven't quite reached that yet, but we're, we're very close to achieving that, um, that goal. Um, also, there are very important sections on non-discrimination in employment in the military and police establishments and other allied services. Um, it provides for equal access to training and scholarships for women. Um, it works for non-derogatory image of women in media. And it has some uh, sections on public health, on participation, on sports, livelihood and family, and on gender mainstreaming. 
Well, of course, we have other laws on women which contribute to the overall framework for gender responsive governance. In the 1987 Philippine Constitution, which is the current iteration of our Constitution, um, Article 2, Section 14 states that um, the state recognizes the role of women in nation building and shall ensure the fundamental equality before the law of women and men. We have an Anti-Sexual Harassment Act of 1995, um, which declares illegal sexual harassment in employment, education, and training environments. Um, another very long drawn out uh, law, which was subject to heavy, heavy um, debate um, and a lot of drama, a lot of political drama, was the Responsible Parenthood and Republic uh, Reproductive Health Act of uh, 2012, which provides um, access to women um, for services on reproductive health, which is a very, very sensitive issue in a um, majority Roman Catholic country like the Philippines, with um, at least 88% of the population being uh, part of the Roman Catholic Church. We also have um, a slew of laws on violence, addressing violence against women. We have a Republic Act on um, anti-violence against women and children, or um, VAWC. We have an anti-rape law. We have a Rape Victim Assistance and Protection Act, which uh, attempts to address the difficulties um, in, in dealing with rape cases and provides um, more ample protection for witnesses and for victims of rape. Um, we have an anti-sexual harassment law, anti-trafficking of persons act, and we also have one of the more recent um, legislative um, initiatives um, towards more gender, gender responsive governance in the Philippines, and that's the Safe Spaces Act. And these laws serve to protect women, women against violence, uh, in general, domestic violence, gender-based harassment, gender-based bullying, including um, increasing the increasing number of cases of online bullying or cyberbullying. On other aspects of women in nation building, um, on, on the business um, sector, for example, we have laws supporting women in business. There is um, the Women in Development in Nation Building Act, um, the Labor Code of the Philippines and the Comprehensive Agrarian Reform Law of the Philippines, which provides for incentives um, for women in agribusiness and in farming. In 2016, just to give you an idea, more women than men launched new businesses in the Philippines. And um, the same survey from the UN um, places the Philippines on the same footing um, as other countries where more women entrepreneurs launch new businesses, um, such as Mexico, Vietnam, and Indonesia. In 2018, the Philippines ranked ninth best globally for female entrepreneurs. And in 2019, the Philippines um, scored um, over 80%, which was a good rating in the World Bank's Women Business and the Law Index. Um, the legal framework for women entrepreneurs in the Philippines is generally supportive. And um, we have among the world's highest percentage of firms with female participation at 69%. However, there remain many areas for improvement, such as women's access to loans, credit, capital, and um, also addressing the um, multi multifaceted role of women in society and taking into account that women entrepreneurs also have um, domestic duties and responsibilities. On women in education in the Philippines, in, in general, in, in the Philippines, um, Filipinos value education highly, particularly for their children. They, they consider that a key to success. So in that sense, there are many similarities, for example, with the Republic of Korea, uh, Korea's own you know, um, societal attitude towards education. And in the Philippine census of 2013, overall we have a 96.5% literacy rate, but um, 90, um, at 97% for women and 96.10% for men, um, women um, are, have a slightly higher liter literacy rate than men in our society. And we also have one of the highest tertiary education participation rates in the world. Women, understandably, um, still remain more predominant in the arts, in the social sciences, in the nursing sciences, for example. Um, but uh, we are hopefully working towards um, more spaces for women to go into other, um, other fields, such as the STEM field, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, trade, and agriculture. 
And um, women in law, for example, the numbers are also steady, steadily increasing. So we are now working on changes in the school curriculum, um, elimination, moving towards elimination of certain gender stereotypes, boosting uh, general awareness on gender issues, and of course promoting modeling and mentorship for, um, for women and uh, for young women and girls. Now, to move the, um, the gender mainstreaming, um, to move the uh, gender mainstreaming agenda forward, recently we've uh, made an innovation in governance. Um, all government agencies and instrumentalities in the Philippines now have to subscribe to a, what is called a gender equality and women's um, empowerment plan or GW. GEWE or GEWE, and the latest version, the latest iteration of this runs um, from the period 2019 to 2025. And this is part of the overall Philippine plan for gender responsive development for, um, for, from 1995 to 2025. And the GEWE contains strategic actions that concretize our government's commitment um, to the Magna Carta for Women law. Um, to contribute to the Philippines' medium-term uh, plan, or our Ambition 2040. It also helps to facilitate um, the implementation of the Philippines' international commitments to gender equality and women's empowerment um, under CEDAW, the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action, um, the UN Security Council resolutions on women, peace, and security, the 2030 SDG goals, uh, especially goal number five, and various ASEAN action plans on gen gender equality and mainstreaming. It is essentially a roadmap for gender and development, or GAD, or GAD, programs across government. And um, under this system, each agency in the Philippines has um, a GAD focal point and team. So it's the same with our ministry, it's the same, let's say, for the Ministry of Trade, it's the same for the Ministry of Finance, it's the same for the um, Philippine Aerospace um, Authority. And we have an annual gender and development budget equivalent to 5% of the total budget of the agency, the office or the post. For example, here in Seoul, um, my overall 5% of my overall budget every year here at the Philippine Embassy in Seoul should be devoted solely to gender and development. And many will say that 5% is not enough. Um, I think um, as we move along the post-pandemic recovery um, period, hopefully we'll be able to increase that budget and um, provide more resources for gender and development programs. And um, you know, for, for, that, for that budgetary um, allocation, we are, um, we are responsible for coming up with training programs, interventions, skills growth, um, education activities. We are supposed to work on and analyze and submit gender desegregated data. Um, we are also subject to regular audit by the Philippine Commission on Women of our gender and development programs. And um, like I said, um, all our Philippine embassies and consulates general overseas, all 96 of our, of our offices, also have to be subjected into this gender, subjected to a gender audit. I'd like to talk very briefly um, about women in Philippine diplomacy as um, an example of how we're trying to develop more gender responsive governance. It, it's something that, that I know very closely because I used to serve um, for some years as the gender and development focal point of, of our ministry. Of course, diplomacy for many years has been considered really the province of, 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 of men, of, of gentlemen. Sensitive matters like um, uh, matters of state like wars, negotiations, were deemed more suitable for men than women, but diplomacy is changing as the world is changing. And um, there is now more gender balance in diplomacy, and diplomacy itself has changed from traditional diplomacy focus on, focusing on political and security matters, now to um, current diplomacy or more modern diplomacy, which covers everything from political and security to cultural diplomacy, and Korea is one um, excellent example of um, you know of making full use of um, of uh, cultural diplomacy, public diplomacy, economic diplomacy, climate change, migration, gender, and um, women now have a seat at the negotiating table, but we need to occupy more of them. I, I'd like to share that. Um, 
Compared to other countries in the Philippine Foreign Service, half of the heads of our missions abroad are, um, are women. There's now, um, at just by you know, at this particular time, there are about 51% women chiefs of mission, women uh, chiefs of mission um, heading our embassies and consulates abroad compared to 49 um, headed by gentlemen. I, I don't know if, um, if that's... Uh, I think it's a very good sign. I don't know if we'll be able to maintain it. Hopefully we can. Um, and, you know, we, we've had some women pioneers in ASEAN diplomacy. Um, the Philippines um, has had uh, its uh, first woman career foreign minister, Delia Domingo Albert. And, of course, from our dear colleagues here from Indonesia, the longest serving woman foreign minister in ASEAN uh, uh, Her Excellency Retno Marsudi, the foreign minister of Indonesia. I think currently she is the longest serving foreign minister in ASEAN. And for women in diplomacy, we find that the qualities suited to modern day diplomacy or in international relations work, um, you know, there's synergy between certain qualities that women diplomats have with the demands of diplomacy today. You know, the caring, nurturing, empathetic side, the attention to detail, the attention to results, um, multitasking. And in the pandemic, um, at least in the Philippine experience, many of our women um, senior officials emerged as natural crisis managers because, you know, we were, we're very good at running households and juggling things, many things all at once. I think in the pandemic, in the pandemic, everyone didn't know really. No, no one had a real, um, had a real foolproof roadmap to handling the pandemic. And I think, you know, the innovation, the um, the crisis management skills of, of women diplomats um, came into the fore. But at negotiate as negotiators, we still have a lot to prove. Um, I think we have the range, but we still need to prove that we we do have that range and that we can manifest manifest that range in the negotiating table, whether it's on complex and sensitive um, issues like denuclearization, space policy, trade, and other matters. I'm, I keep thinking I keep going back to Ambassador Rose Gottmuller, who headed the U.S. negotiating team for the U.S.-Russia Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty or the START talks. Um, and I think when, when she appeared on, on the global stage as the chief negotiator, it encouraged, and I go back here to mentoring and modeling, it encouraged a lot of women diplomats to be engaged in nuclear policy-related negotiations, um, which is often the domain of our male counterparts, and, um, and to use and to build and to use personal networks to effectively steer and accelerate negotiations. And it showed that women could have the range for complex negotiations. And some more examples here, the former um, Foreign Minister of uh, Korea, Kang Kyung-hwa, uh, the late Secretary of State, U.S. Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright, and the foreign, former um, Australian Foreign Minister, Julie Bishop. And there are many challenges and opportunities for, ahead for women in diplomacy. Um, we need to show our range. We need more of them in senior positions. Um, we need more women educators in international relations and more mentorship opportunities for women and we've been, what we've been trying to do as part of gender responsive governance in, um, in the Philippine Foreign Service is that we subject um, our women diplomats, our, all of our diplomats to negotiations training and we've launched um, for a few years now a mentorship program specifically for women in diplomacy. And so we see here that, that while many countries um, have perhaps already uh, really develop their gender responsive governance framework. Um, the Philippines is actually just, I would say, in my own assessment, in the middle stages of really setting up that governance framework. There are still many challenges and opportunities for women overall. Um, there's the education challenge um, for more gender sensitive and gender responsive attitudes, acknowledging in governance, policy formulation and implementation that women's and girls' rights are fundamental human rights. I think that's a very basic concept. Um, we need to address the concerns of marginalized women. Um, poverty alleviation goes hand in hand with gender, um, gender equality and development. Empowerment issues um, remain um, elusive um, overall. Um, we need to accelerate women political representation and we need to respond uh, to urgent concerns of migrant women, women affected by civil unrest, displacement and war. 
Um, so a snapshot of um, what we in the Philippines are, are hoping to do in terms of contributing um, to gender equality and empowerment globally. We're involved in all of these campaigns. Of course, we have our international commitments under SIDAO, under the He for She campaign, under the very important SDG goal number five, and also our commitments to the movement on um, uh, vi uh, movement against violence against women and children. So let me end my talk there. So there's ample time for our other co-panelists. But I hope um, that brief um, snapshot, that introduction to what we've been trying to do in the Philippines, laying the, both the legislative groundwork and also the implementation for gender responsive um, governance um, will be of some use to you in your, your future endeavors. Once again, maraming salamat. Thank you. Kamsam nida. Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker uh, will be the Ambassador Amit Kumar from the Embassy of India. Prior to taking up his current assignment in Seoul, he was the Council General of India in Chicago. His overseas missions include Washington DC, Tokyo, Beijing, and Berlin. He was also Joint Secretary for Human Resources Management in the Ministry of External Affairs and Director in the Foreign, Serv uh, Foreign Secretary's Office in New Delhi. He will be giving a presentation on how India is advancing big data technologies for sustainable development. So everyone, please help me in welcoming Ambassador Amit Kumar. members of the diplomatic court, distinguished guests. At the outset, I would like to thank the Korea Development Institute for organizing this important series of conversation on de development issues as part of this global governance and diplomacy workshop. I have been asked to speak on the subject of big data and sustainable development. This is indeed a very timely and relevant topic for our discussion, for discussion today. Digital transformation is one of the most remarkable changes of our times. In recent years, we have seen the footprint of digitization growing in every sector of economic activity. Digital technologies are transforming the way we work, we live, we interact, we entertain ourselves. And it is also changing how businesses offer goods and services, how consumers access those goods and services. It also opens up opportunity not only for private businesses but for governments to reimagine how they de deliver public services. Now, in India, leveraging technology for improving governance and delivery outcomes is a key priority for the government. And since digital infrastructure will play a key role, perhaps as important as the physical infrastructure in the coming years, we have taken a rather unique approach to this area. We believe that the appropriate use of digital technologies and data can have a multiplier effect in alleviating poverty as well as ensuring sustainable development. However, these benefits can only be realized when digital access is truly inclusive and the use of digital technology is, widely, is really widespread. As the Prime Minister outlined in his remarks at G20 Bali Summit, digital transformation will be one of the key pillars for our G20 presidency. Now, if we, if we take a look at this issue globally, there are perhaps three, four differing approaches, three, four differing approaches to this matter. On one side, we have the United States, where it's, it's essentially the private sector plays the predominant role. Uh, EU is perhaps somewhat similar, but has a more regulatory approach to the digital space. Then we have the China model. Um, and so far as India is concerned, the government has been investing heavily in creation of public digital infrastructure to be used as a public utility. We believe that just as governments invest in public physical infrastructure as roads or bridges, we need to also do so for public digital infrastructure. And it is essential to do so to bridge the digital divide that exists today. Um, 
the broad objectives for such uh, a policy would be to decentralize data sharing, to democratize data access, to allow interoperability between different data sets, to have informed consent of the individual, to ensure transparency and so on. Now called India stack with many use cases, uh, it is a decentralized public digital infrastructure based on open source, open application programming interface, open standards and so on. So I will touch upon some of the use cases in my presentation as well as the challenges uh, that exist in fully realizing these objectives that we have set for ourselves. In India, while we had a national data sharing and accessi accessibility um, uh, policy that was introduced in 2012, the foundation was really laid through the Aadhaar, a unique biometric based identity card system introduced in 2009. Um, and then through 2012 to 2015, the India stack was built on what is called the JAM initiative, uh, focusing on financial inclusion, Aadhaar card and mobile internet. Then in 2016, Government of India launched the, unite, the Unified Payment Interface, which has proved to be very successful and I'll touch upon it in my remarks. And the three most prominent cases that the government is in the process of testing and rolling out are A, a open network for digital commerce, B, a open credit enablement network for promoting credit based on cash flow lending, and C, the national health mission for healthcare and insurance. Now due to paucity of time today, I will only talk about the ONDC or the public digital platform for e-commerce. Um, to ensure efficiency in delivery of public services through such platforms, it is important to ensure a certain level of foundational digital infrastructure, including based on identity verification, digital payments and data sharing systems. Uh, so let me begin with uh, the, the initial success in India, which is called the Jam Trinity. Uh, I had mentioned about, it, about this, Jandhan Financial Inclusion the Aadhaar identity card and the mobile phone connections. To put this in perspective as to what has happened in India, let me refer to some numbers here. We have 1.2 million, uh, 1.2 billion unique identity cards. Um, we have uh, 470 new bank accounts opened since 2014. And in terms of mobile phone subscriptions, these increased from 17 per 100 in 2007 to 84 in 2019. In absolute numbers, we have close to 1.2 billion mobile phone subscriptions and with uh, the share of smartphones around 500 million. Now, the data consumption in India is amongst the highest, the cost of data amongst the lowest, but the most unusual and unique point about India is that we have far greater number of data consumers who access data through mobile phones, uh, through smartphones. Now the JAM Trinity brings together three digital transformations and exploit synergies among them. The Aadhaar Identity Card enables customers and banks to easily fulfill know your customer or KYC norms necessary to obtain a bank account or a mobile SIM card, while costs have been further reduced by allowing possibility of a digital or electronic KYC. The other identity cards are also linked organically to the new bank accounts and as a result financial inclusion has been advanced significantly in India. Now the unified payments interface which was introduced in 2016 has been a watershed moment in the history of our financial system. From a humble beginning of around 2.6 million transactions in 2016, totaling 120 million US dollars, in September 22, in one month alone, we had 6.78 billion transactions, totaling 137 billion. In the current financial year, we expect the UPI to handle transactions worth 1.5 trillion dollars. By some estimates, this has resulted in a GDP efficiency gain of 0.5 to 1 percent of our economy. Um, 
I just wanted to refer to one additional point, which was the 470 new million bank accounts which are opened do not show disparity between urban account holders and rural account holders, and thereby this means that many of these new bank accounts were opened in, in rural areas. Now, the unified payment interface is handled by a non-profit National Payments Corporation of India and the Reserve Bank of India has, uh, and the Reserve Bank of India and it has been designated as a public good. Then the National Payments Corporation of India sets the standards and allowed application programming interface, access to all the stakeholders, inviting a slew of innovations in the financial technology space. Today, more than 350 plus banks in India are part of the UPI platform. And, and the reason it has become so popular is because using it is very easy. You don't have to memorize 16 digit bank account numbers or complicated IFSC codes. And you can actually access this through QR codes that can be received on your mobile phones and so on. And this, this Ease of uh, accessing the UPI has led many mom and pop stores to actually um, adopt um, fin digital financial transaction as a main, as a mode of payment for for their goods and services. I will now turn briefly to another very interesting innovation which has taken place in India, which is the launch of uh, e-rupee in 2021. Uh, originally designed for our vaccination program. So this was a cashless vaccination program, but provides a glimpse into what uh, uh, potential a digital rupee can hold. And this could also be thought as a programmable money built into a digital token, a unique alphanumeric string, which can codify the purpose for which this money can be spent. Uh, it can even be programmed to expire. So, for example, many of the government social security and welfare uh, programs can benefit from this feature. A subsidy which is intended to pay for a child's education then cannot be diverted to any other use by the parents. Uh, and similarly, the e-rupee token was compatible with feature phones, meaning phones which were not smartphones and can be transacted offline. So this promises to enable a UPI-like experience to roughly 60% of mobile users for their payment needs. Uh, as I mentioned previously, the government is in the process of developing open networks for digital commerce, for credit, and for a national digital health mission. I will confine myself to the ONDC. Uh, which is essentially, essentially a network that allows sellers to display their products and services across all participating apps and platforms. Since the network uses open specifications and protocols and is not tied down to any particular platform, it does not require buyers and sellers to be on the same platform to complete a transaction. So long as the platforms are connected to this open network, buyers and sellers can transact irrespective of the applications. And again, uh, we have launched a pilot test run in five major metropolitan cities in India. Um, but, the, but the basic objective is again to, to somehow uh, get and encourage a mom and pop stores, the, the retail sector in India, onboarded to a digital e-commerce platform. And, and due to a high investment which is required to build end-to-end e-commerce solutions, um, Small retailers and medium and small enterprises often have little choice but to sell through established platforms. And uh, the objective really is to facilitate a shift from an operator-driven monolithic platform-centric model to a facilitator-driven interoperable decentralized network. The ONDC aims to raise the e-commerce penetration from nearly 8% uh, currently in India to around 25% in the next two years. And how will it work? Of course, we need 
private sector to join hands in, uh, in such an initiative. And uh, it is very satisfying to note that Microsoft uh, has, um, is now a part of this initiative, which is pushed forth by the government. Now, I will, as I said, I will skip the sections on national digital health yep. and the credit platform. So, I will now refer to a few other initiatives in India where we have leveraged digital infrastructure or tools like artificial intelligence or machine learning for public delivery of services. Since we are meeting in person, we are slowly receding out from the COVID-induced situation. It is perhaps apt to talk about the digital tools that helped us with the vaccination program, COVID-19 vaccination program in India. Um, this platform called COVIN is a cloud-based system which helped with registration, with immunizations, appointments, vaccinations, and so on. And given our geographical size and large population, it was indeed a daunting task to plan the COVID-19 vaccination program. Uh, we leveraged several existing and proven digital assets, including electronic vaccine intelligence network, DigiLocker, the digital infrastructure for vaccination, open credentialing, and so on. The portal itself was a simple user interface for beneficiaries to register and select a convenient public facility, health facility, with an option to choose the vaccine type. Healthcare professionals use this app to verify registered beneficiaries, vaccine doses given, and record any adverse event following the vaccination. Real-time online dashboards allowed program managers to track data and take decisions on vaccine distribution across the country. Now, as of 23rd of November 2022, COVID platform has registered 2.3 billion vaccine doses. Now, through this platform, the users can also get a digital vaccine certificate delivered in QR code format via a text message or a printed copy. Users can also link their passports and generate a certificate for international travel. And the government of India has offered the COVID platform as a digital public good to other countries around the world in an effort to boost vaccine equity and accessibility. And since the COVID platform itself is based on an open platform. It can be easily customized for different locations around the world. Uh, let me refer to another example um, which shows how technology can somehow sometimes help you uh, address the problem of human resource shortage. So, for example, in the state of Tamil Nadu, uh, we had this pilot project involving a smartphone apps to uh, check for cataract. Now, in many remote and uh, remote areas in India, people tend to associate cataract with a normal aging process without realizing that this is something which can be cured uh, through a simple surgical intervention. So, the state government in Tamil Nadu developed this app with, of course, private sector help. Um, high school students were enlisted to to actually talk to the target segment, explain them about COVID, take photographs of the eyes with the consent of the of, of these people, and then these photographs were uh, matched against the database, which was continually being improved. Uh, being improved, when the exercise began, this smartphone app had a success rate of 60 percent. Very soon, it became 90 percent, and today it is better than the human eye. But what, is, what it has also helped is timely detection of um, cataract among patients, helped with timely intervention, and basically reduced uh, blindness, which was curable. Uh, I'll very briefly run through three more examples. For example, the Indian Institute in, of Technology in Khadakpur has developed an AI-based model to track and successfully predict distribution of groundwater contaminants. Um, in another successful study, uh, we developed economical and a sturdy sensor-based Internet of Things network to monitor rural drinking water supply, measuring aspects such as quantity, duration, quality pressure, etc., which has led to better operational efficiency and better responsiveness to grievances. 
Uh, the pilot study was conducted in five states, spread across different agroclimatic conditions and different types of water resources. Now, uh, this uh, project is being taken up nationally. And, and the last example is use of digital land records, how uh, that is uh, improving access to credit for uh, small landowners. So, so I'll stop there, but I also wanted to, uh, to talk about a few challenges as we proceed on this um, road. I think some of the problems are common to countries across the world, and these would relate to data deficit, data governance, reliability of digital services, data privacy, uh, data anonymity, and so on. And our overall approach can be best captured and uh, captured through the draft digital personal data protection bill, which has been recently released earlier this month. And it has uh, seven basic principles. And I'll just quickly re read through those. Um, the first is the usage of personal data by organizations must be done in a manner which is as per the law and which is done in a transparent, transparent fashion. The date, second principle states that the personal data must be used only for the purpose it was collected. The third principle talks of data minimization, only the appropriate data to be collected. Fourth principle puts emphasis on data accuracy, accuracy when it is being collected. The fifth principle talks of how personal data that is collected should not be stored perpetually by default and storage should or can be limited to a fixed duration. Um, and similarly, a sixth principle says that there should be reasonable safeguards to ensure that there are no unauthorized collection of, or processing of personal data. And the last principle is that the person who decides the purpose and the means of processing of personal data should also be held accountable for such processing. Uh, should, be, should be accountable, not held, should be accountable for such processing. Now, this is, this is the broad approach to various data and uh, data issues, but uh, in terms of a vision to have a more accessible and inclusive uh, data digital, um, or digital infrastructure, several other dimensions are very important. One is the capacity of the users. Um, it is important to skill the users so that can fully participate in such platforms and benefit from them. And even if the user is capable of exercising these options, he may not own the necessary digital infrastructure to access those platforms. So to ensure wide accessibility, the Common Services Center is one of the mission mode projects under the Digital India program. Uh, these are essentially access points for delivery of essential public utility services, social welfare schemes, and, and so on. And this is a pan-India network that caters to regional geography a geographic, linguistic, and cultural diversity of the country. Uh, I would just want to mention one point that the government is also using natural language processing to make available many of these services in different languages uh, because that speeds up um, um, the, or rather compresses the time frame in which we can do so. Uh, also, for, for example, to translate education content, India is a very unique country. We have 20 odd official languages with different scripts is spoken by at least 10 million people each. So you can, you can imagine the, the, uh, the complexity that it entails in, in terms of provisioning of public services also. Another important element is connecting all villages through a rural broadband program using op optical fiber is called Bharat Net. So that is what we are trying to accomplish. And one last point, um, before I conclude is, is the fact that we have several, wel several welfare schemes and several uh, programs running. We have several distinct data sets which can be possibly used uh, for, for data analytics. However, they are, as you can imagine, they are in different formats. So the challenge is how, do you, how does one link them? How do we make them truly interoperable? How do data sets talk to each other? Uh, to derive the full potential of AI and machine learning tools. So I'll, I'll stop there, but I do hope to uh, carry on with the conversation during the Q&A um, session. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Ambassador Kumar. Our next speaker is Mr. Gareth Ware, the Deputy Head of Mission of the British Embassy. He began his mission in Seoul in July of this year, and prior to Korea, he was at the D Department for International Development and worked extensively across the United States. Africa and Asia on international development, investment, trade, and climate. And he's here to talk to us today about mobilizing investment for SDGs. So please, everyone, welcome Mr. Ware. Thank you very much. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. Come somewhere down. Um, so good afternoon. My name is Gareth. Uh, I am the deputy ambassador here in the UK. Uh, delighted to be here. Uh, so thank you very much for including me to uh, the dean and the team. Fantastic event. Uh, really interesting range of conversations. As I said, I'm I, I'm uh, I work for the FCDO. So um, I was previously in the Department for International Development. Uh, worked overseas for over a decade. So this is a subject close to my heart. Uh, today I wanted to talk a bit about mobilizing investment for the SDGs. So to start with the context, I think it's important to recognize where we are. After a couple of decades of very significant progress in terms of eliminating extreme poverty, we have gone backwards as a result of COVID-19, 100 million plus more people pushed back into extreme poverty. We also know that the fallout from the war in Ukraine is causing serious challenges around the world. Cost of living has gone up. Debt, fiscal and financial stress, along with ongoing COVID-19 pandemic challenges and the climate crisis. All of this is putting stresses and strains, particularly on developing countries. We know that growth estimates have gone down as a result. And the risks are significant, deepening hardship, debt defaults, widening, widening inequality, political upheaval, and a delayed shift to the low carbon world. Interestingly, coming out of Barbados is the Bridgetown Agenda, which I think if you haven't seen is well worth looking into. Their mantra, we cannot be good at rescuing banks, but be bad at saving countries. And they are calling to lay the path for a new financial system that drives financial resources towards climate action and sustainable development goals. We know the estimates required by developing countries are 3.5 trillion a year for basic infrastructure, food security, climate change, mitigation, adaptation, health, education. They are significant. And it will require a step change in both public sector and importantly, private investment. Public sector funding on its own will be way insufficient. And private sector at the moment, only a, world, only a fraction of the worldwide invested assets of banks and pension funds, insurers, foundations, endowments are in SDG sectors or developing countries, at least the poorest ones. We know that the Growth Commission has said that growth can spare people en masse from poverty and drudgery. Nothing else ever has. So how is it that we can get more investment back into job creation, infrastructure, health, education? One answer um, is to mobilize more investment. And the, the, the UK presidency of the G7, which finishes shortly, um, uh, one of the big ticket items that we pushed for was to help mobilize all this global partnerships on infrastructure and investment. So 600 billion over five years for the G7 plus investing around the world and the UK, our aspiration to invest 8 billion a year as part of that initiative. And that's based on the, um, our, I guess, development finance background that we have, I'll talk a bit about, and the strong expertise offer and the, and the City of London being a strong financial hub. But we know that is only a fraction of what's needed. Uh, we need trillions, not billions. So how is it that we get the private sector more involved? As you said, I worked a lot overseas, and so some of these are my reflections on trying to get more private investment into developing countries. And clearly, there's a real or perceived set of risks around the enabling environment in many of these countries that we want to invest in, the political stability, 
The regulatory environment can be confusing or not even welcome sometimes. The lack of enabling infrastructure. The scarce management skills to be able to manage projects. So the enabling environment can be challenging. Equally, projects are hard to find. So even if you have the money and want to try and find projects, they can be difficult to find bankable projects. All of which is to say, um, we strongly believe there is a strong argument for investing public finance to help catalyze these markets. I apologize for the slightly busy slide here, but I want to just try and explain, set out a little bit about how the UK is approaching it, thinking about the ecosystem of investment. So the top row, if you like, is the private finance, and I'll talk a bit about British international investment as our DFI as a deep dive in a minute. But the other pieces of the puzzle for us, so the Private Infrastructure Development Group, PIDGE, as its nickname, is a multilateral fund which works on projects. So that's trying to address this question about building a pipeline of investable projects. The Mobilist is a program which tries to put through public listed markets, so putting new products on public listed markets. Uh, one in London exchange recently being new, a, a product on the Market Renewable Energy Investment Trust. Coming down the road, the UK Export Finance. So this is our credit agency, provides loans, guarantees, insurance to help companies sell goods, services, and intangibles overseas. And then in the middle, we have the British Support for Infrastructure. So the ambition is that this will be set up next year and will support a set of ODA eligible countries to develop relationships um, to assist them in prioritizing and developing their pipeline of public infrastructure projects. We have the Multilateral Development Bank Guarantee. So this is the UK using its balance sheet to push multilateral banks to do more and take more risks. And underpinning all of that is, is offers of expertise and support. And this uh, one strong example here is in the climate space where we offer technical expertise to countries implementing their NDC. We would like to expand it to other areas. So picking up one of those, so the British International Investment, uh, this is our DFI, if you like, wholly owned by the department I work for, the FCDO, established in 1948. It's the world's first impact investor, 70 years of experience supporting sustainable long-term growth of businesses in Africa and Asia. Its mission is to solve the biggest global development challenges. Its mandate is development, but also financial sustainability. It's a major part of our international development strategy released this year, and is part of our commitment to uh, stronger, more transparent economic partnerships. It's wholly owned by the UK government, uh, the department I work for, uh, although it is an arm's length body, so it manages its own finances and investments. So how does it work? This is a classic development theory of change in some ways. So it has lots of capital to invest, seven to 10 billion, that capital is patient capital, eight to 10 years normally. It's also flexible, so equity, debt, and funds. It also brings with it some sector expertise, so people are very expert in the particular sectors that we're looking at, and seeks to partner with businesses, not just as an investor, but as a partner to help build the business, right through management layers and ESG capabilities. And we hope that will help with capital and expertise, build businesses that are successful, but also importantly, strengthen the markets for further investment. And so the impact, as, as, as we challenge um, the BI to deliver, is, is the number of jobs is a key metric, both direct jobs created by investments and indirect jobs created by those businesses. And again, back to Her Excellency's conversation or starting presentation, there's a big, big focus on gender in that and ensuring, looking at specifically who benefits from this growth, and specifically targeting uh, women in that process. It clearly also brings benefit in tax, because these businesses pay tax, uh, and we seek to capitalize and catalyze other private sector investments in the markets that we pitch. So the portfolio today has eight billion in the portfolio, just over, with further in the pipeline, 1,300 businesses, across 67 uh, countries. Last year, it created, or it has a portfolio of 938,000 full-time equivalent workers through the investments it's made, uh, adding 22,000 jobs last year. 
and it's mobilized over 2.5 billion of additional capital from private sector investors. So where we've taken some risk and further private sector has come in behind us. And super importantly, value for money, which at the moment is with the cost of living, uh, a very key facet. It has demonstrated return of 6.6% over the period. Um, so it effectively washes its own face, as we would say. To give you a sort of sense of the spectrum of investments, so uh, on the right-hand side, some of the larger investments um, that we have put in uh, and some companies looking at renewables, looking at internet, uh, uh, and looking at some trade links. On the left-hand side, you can see some of the different products we have, so trade and supply chain finance, uh, venture capital, uh, and SMEs. And, and SMEs is the world that I've come from working in, uh, which is, the, I think, the most difficult and risky part of the portfolio. We have an ambition to expand into the Indo-Pacific. So the 2022-26 expansion um, reflects the UK's ambition to tilt into Indo-Pacific as a priority for the UK foreign policy and development. We will invest 10 billion into this region. Um, we just opened a regional office in Singapore. And the major theme for us in this region will be climate. So briefly, uh, to give you a couple of or three case studies. Um, so here is a company in India that we've invested in, uh, Seed Capital uh, in a renewable energy company, 100 million equity, and then it's successfully received further uh, uh, capital, and it's just created or reached one gigawatt of operational capacity in renewables in India. This one uh, is, a, is a partnership with DP World, uh, a major so long-term partner, a so global leader in supply chain solutions. And anyone who's lived in a landlocked country before, uh, which I have, knows the importance of getting trade links to ports so you can connect with global markets, which are fundamental to growth. Uh, and this is around a partnership about expanding three ports uh, and the logistics that flow from that, uh, and the ambition to improve access to vital goods for 35 million people. And then finally, uh, the first private telecommunications private, uh, provider in Ethiopia. So with some very significant partners there in Eastern Southern Africa, this uh, partnership is designed to offer affordable internet access for tens of million people in Ethiopia. And as we've just heard from the ambassador, the importance of having internet access and digital access for development. These are things that underpin. So that's all I was going to say. I'm very happy to carry on the conversation and uh, look forward to the Q&A. But come Samida. Thank you very much, Mr. Ware. Our last presenter for the afternoon session is Ms. Adianti Sardinarina. We are Judah, Counselor and Coordinator of Economy, Investment and Trade Affairs of the Embassy of Indonesia. Before she worked as the counselor in Seoul, she was the deputy director for ASEAN Political Security Cooperation at the Foreign Ministry of Indonesia. And she is going to be speaking to us today about the recent G20 summit that took place under the theme of Recovery Together, Recover Stronger. During Indonesia's presidency of the G20, she coordinated potential bilateral deliverables related to strengthening global health architecture energy transition, and other economic issues. So please welcome her today. Thank you very much. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I must admit, this is quite a task for me uh, to be the last speaker in the afternoon session, especially after uh, hearing uh, from this morning uh, such an uh, impeccable list of speakers. and. Um, First of all, I would like to thank um, Mr. Jong Il Yu, Dean of the KDI School of Public Policy and Management, and his excellent team for convening this uh, wonderful event. Um, I would also like to uh, say hello to um, the Diplomatic Corps and to the KDI students. and. Um, it is truly an honor for the Embassy of Indonesia to be invited uh, as a speaker at this workshop. And in this regard, uh, I would like to convey um, uh, sincere wishes from Ambassador Gandhi Solistianto, who 
unfortunately cannot join us here today. So, um, as you can see, um, the topic of the presentation here to, uh, today is regarding Indonesia's G20 presidency. And uh, we would like to share Indonesia's uh, policy experience and also uh, our experiences as president of G20 for this year. So, Indonesia is very, very honored to hold the G20 presidency for 2022. For as we all know, the G20 is the world's economic uh, powerhouse. Uh, the 20 members countries represent 85% of the global GDP and 75% of international trade and two thirds of the world population. So undoubtedly, the G20 holds a very strategic significance in geopolitical and regional economic development. And uh, it also serves to bridge the interest and power play in the member countries' world economic affairs. And this is a brief outline of uh, the presentation that I will be delivering today. So, Indonesia held the G20 presidency in quite a challenging and complex situation of global uncertainty due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And undoubtedly, the pandemic has affected every aspect of society, whether it be from health education to international trade. And at the same time, uh, there are gaps in countries' capacities to address the issues and to continue to prevent the world from fully addressing common problems and crisis. So considering the purpose, the core purpose of the G20 and recognizing as well the importance of collective action and inclusive collaboration among major developed countries and emerging economies, Indonesia therefore tried to address the complex challenges of COVID-19. And it is for this reason that the Indonesian G20 presidency carried the spirit of recovery with the theme, recovered together, recover stronger. So the the theme behind this is that the G20 must act as a catalyst for a joint and inclusive um, efforts to find a global solution to recover from the pandemic, especially in assisting developing countries. So as you can see from this slide, Indonesia's G20 presidency focuses on global partnerships that result in concrete, tangible, and impactful deliverables. Continuation is an essential aspect of the G20's uh, success, and therefore a lot of the achievements under Indonesia's G20 presidency are based, of course, on the G20 Rome Leaders Declaration. Um, this slide shows uh, briefly the logo of Indonesia's G20 presidency, and uh, it marks a symbol of collective action, one that sparks a spirit to really uh, recover together in the post-pandemic world. And it also presents a theme for which the G20 will direct its efforts towards inclusivity and sustainable global economic recovery, where I would like to emphasize that no country will be left behind. So inclusivity is really key in our presidency of the G20. During the G20 presidency, 
Indonesia focused on three priority sectors, namely strengthening the global health architecture, transition towards sustainable energy, and accelerating digital transformation. And through these three sectors, Indonesia seeks to continue to ensure equitable access to COVID-19 vaccines, to commit to using energy transition to achieve a green economy and drive sustainable development, and also to promote sustainable and inclusive economic development through MSME participation and the digital economy. As I mentioned before, uh, Indonesia's presidency of the G20 faced uh, some challenges. Um, we had the post-COVID-19 recovery efforts still overshadowing us, and at the same time, this combined with uh, the unstable geopolitical situation and the rising tension between the major powers uh, caused uh, some, a little, some complications, if I might say. And um, this geopolitical situation automatically um, can cause sharp rivalries, which in turn undoubtedly has influenced the dynamics and the uh, discussions in the G20 work stream. Um, for this, I'd like to um, emphasize that unfortunately, none of the working groups were able to produce a consensus communique. And uh, undoubtedly, the Russia-Ukraine um, conflict also dominated discussions uh, in, in Indonesia's presidency of the G20. And I wish to uh, briefly emphasize Indonesia's uh, position on this issue, both in its national capacity as well as uh, as president of the G20. Indonesia has consistently called for a peaceful resolution to uh, this issue, to this months long conflict. And in June earlier this year, um, President Joko Widodo visited Russia and Ukraine and met with President Putin and also with President Zelensky and invited both of them to the G20 summit. Nevertheless, despite the geopolitical uh, dynamics, Indonesia's presidency of the G20 resulted in approximately 446 meetings. And this was conducted uh, in Indonesia and many other countries at various levels. And to usher the collective efforts in achieving the three priority sectors under Indonesia's presidency um, of the G20, uh, as you know, the G20 divided its work streams into the Sherpa track and finance track, as you can see on the screen. And this is the list of ministerial meetings that were also held under the Indonesia's presidency of the G20. So turning to the G20 Bali summit, which as you all know is uh, the peak of Indonesia's uh, presidency of the G20, it was held in Bali on 15 and 16 November 2022. 20 member countries nine invited countries and 10 invited international organizations attended the summit. And as a concrete step to showcase Indonesia's commitment to a renewable in um, industry and strong cooperation with Korea in building the electric vehicle ecosystem, Indonesia has selected the Hyundai G80 long chassis EV as the official VIP car for the heads of state. And uh, it was a form of appreciation from the Indonesian government to Hyundai for investing in the country's uh, electric vehicle ecosystem. The G20 Bali summit was also a good opportunity to exchange views on the war in Ukraine and to uh, press for a peaceful solution. 
the G20 Bali Summit has successfully succeeded in producing the G20 Bali Leaders Declaration. At first, many parties had um, initially doubted that Indonesia can produce this declaration. The declaration is very significant for Indonesia as it serves as a political commitment at the highest level that provides direction for the G20 cooperation to promote global recovery. The declaration consists of 52 paragraphs that summarizes all the processes of the Indonesian presidency. Similar to the G20 Rome Leaders Declaration in October 2021, almost 50% of the 52 paragraphs contained in this 16-page uh, G20 Leaders Declaration um, addressed ongoing problems such as uh, in the economy, such as fair and multilateral trade, energy and food security, um, international taxation, etc. All the policy recommendations in this declaration support the theme of recover together, recover stronger. In the declaration, the leaders also expressed their commitment to stay agile and flexible in their macroeconomic policy responses and to make public investments and structural reforms. They also uh, sought to promote private investments and to strengthen multilateral trade and resilience of global supply chains to support long-term growth and sustainable, inclusive, green and just transitions. The leaders also worked very hard to ensure the long-term fiscal sustainability with central banks um, committed to achieving price stability. And uh, they also remain committed to using all the available tools at their disposal to mitigate downside risk and to, uh, to take, since the global financial crisis, uh, to enhance the resilience and to promote sustainable finance and capital flows. Concerning the three priority sectors under Indonesia's G20 presidency, there were several concrete results as reflected in the declaration. In the energy sector, I wish to emphasize that the leaders agreed to accelerate the energy transition through the Bali Compact and the Energy Transitions Roadmap. This is an important milestone, as this would promote stable, transparent, and affordable energy markets. In the finance sector, the leaders agreed to USD 81.6 billion in aid for the recovery of vulnerable countries. And they also agreed to synergize their policies to maintain macroeconomic and financial stability. In the health sector, there was a commitment to establish the pandemic fund to prevent, prepare, and respond to future pandemics. The G20 also agreed to harmonize um, their protocol standards and cooperation on universal access to vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics. And the declaration, I would like to emphasize this, also contained one highly debated paragraph regarding uh, Ukraine. And through a lengthy uh, discussion, the G20 leaders agreed to condemn the war as it uh, violates the territorial boundaries and integrity. The G20 Bali summit also produced several concrete achievements on, uh, as well as the G20 action on strong and inclusive recovery as annex to the leaders' declaration. This document lists 
361 cooperation projects and concrete contributions of the G20 members. It also invited, um, uh, also uh, uh, included the contributions of the invited countries and the international organizations. Some examples of projects include the formation of the Pandemic Fund, which I have just uh, mentioned earlier, as well as um, the formation of a Resilience and sustainable Sustainability Trust, or RST, under the IMF, which amounts to USD 81.6 billion to help countries in crisis, and also the establishment of the Digital Innovation Network. And concerning the energy transition mechanism, Indonesia received a commitment from the Just Energy Transition Partnership, or JETP, of USD 20, million, 20 billion, which would help Indonesia uh, to shut its coal power plants and bring forward the sector's peak em uh, emissions date by seven years to 2030. The JETP process took more than a year and is defined by many as probably the single largest climate finance transaction or partnership ever. This long-term partnership will accelerate Indonesia's just power transition and it is consistent with the target of keeping the 1.5, uh, one and a half degrees Celsius global warming limit within reach. During the sidelines of the G20 summit, the presidents of Indonesia and Korea also had the opportunity to have an informal bilateral meeting. And they also attended the Korea-Indonesia Business Roundtable during which several pre-signed MOUs, uh, pre-signed G2G, G2B, and B2B MOUs were announced uh, in front of the leaders. Aside from Indonesia's uh, presidency of the G20, I would also like to briefly touch upon uh, the climate change issue as uh, requested. The Vice President of Indonesia attended the UN Framework on Climate Change 27th Conference in Sharm el Sheikh. And at the opening session of the conference, the Vice President um, expressed Indonesia's support for COP27 to become an implementation COP and call for the need to fulfill international commitments and cooperate in facing the challenges of climate change. Indonesia is also uh, has several achievements on this, including in the delivery of enhanced national determined contributions. And the contribution of Indonesia's G20 presidency in driving a green recovery and a strong and inclusive climate action. And also, there is the, we seek to use Indonesia's 2023 chairmanship of ASEAN as a momentum for Indonesia to strengthen climate action. Lastly, I would like to also touch upon Indonesia's policy as on energy, as you can see on the screen. Uh, Indonesia's national policy seeks to transition from fossil energy to new and renewable energy, which is ob obviously cleaner, has less emission, and uh, environmentally friendly. Indonesia is also accelerating efforts in achieving the new and renewable energy mix target of 23% by 2023, and focuses on implementing new and renewable energy. So to conclude, while um, many had higher hopes and expectations for Indonesia's G20 presidency, uh, many consider it to be a success, as it was carried out during uh, quite a challenging uh, time filled with complex geopolitical uh, tensions. The G20 Bali summit successfully 
adopted the G20 Bali Leaders Declaration, which is a political commitment at the highest level that provides direction for G20 cooperation to promote global recovery. Indonesia's presidency also resulted in concrete cooperation projects and contributions in the three priority sectors as determined by Indonesia. These cooperation projects are of high importance as they will foster ties between the efforts of the G20 and the people to ensure that the G20 is beneficial, not only for the members of the G20, but also for the world. And with this, I would like to conclude my presentation. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, Councillor. And thank you to all of our afternoon uh, s session speakers. We're just going to take a few short minutes to rearrange the stage so we can invite them back up for a panel discussion. In the meantime, I would like to ask all of you to, if you don't mind, there's this piece of paper at your desk, or um, if you can fill out the very short survey at the back of the form, um, we would really appreciate it. It really helps us uh, when we plan programs going forward. So if you could just take a few short minutes once again to fill out the back survey. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you and welcome back everyone. I'd like to introduce uh, the moderator for session two, Dr. Hyungwon Go um, has had an illustrious career in the Korean government, including being the former Korean ambassador to the OECD, the first vice minister of the Ministry of Economy and Finance, director of Asia Development Bank and deputy minister for planning and coordination of the Ministry of Economy and Finance. He also happens to be a KDI school alumnus, so we're very proud of that. So with that, I'd like to turn over the mic to our moderator for this afternoon, Dr. Go. Uh, uh. Uh, uh. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Yoon, for the great uh, introduction on me. Uh, moderating uh, this uh, great discussion is a great honor to me uh, and uh, a grave challenge as well to me. Uh, thank uh, Dean, uh, Excellencies, and all the participants. Uh, as you know, uh, we are uh, a bit uh, behind the schedule, so I will try uh, to be uh, as brief as possible. Uh, listening to the presentations, I have discovered uh, many commonalities and solidarities that are essential for us in weathering current global storm, uh, including social gap, uh, climate change, and not to mention current uh, gloomy economic 
아울룩. 엠베세더 음. 어, 어, 테레사 드존 베가 하이라이티드 필리핀스 프로그레스 인 젠더 이퀄리티 이슈. It was really impressive and admirable. Uh, Korea also has achieved a lot uh, in terms of uh, education, labor participation. Uh, but uh, we have more ways to go. Perhaps uh, we need to learn from Philippines. I personally hope Ambassador Vega will be included together with the uh, diplomatic celebrities uh, like Madame Kang kyung as an exemplary Filipino woman diplomat in your future slides. <laughs> Ambassador Kumar from India uh, presented us about the huge potentials and challenges stemming from the uh, digital transition. By illustrating Indian experiences, it recalled me many discussions in the OECD on how to harness the digital transformation. I congratulate on India's achievement in that regard. Mm. Deputy Ambassador Gareth uh, Ware from UK addressed on her ODA strategies. For unlocking investment for infrastructure, climate transitions, and development in developing countries in a very realistic and balanced way. I think it could be a lighthouse to the other developed countries in development financing. Last but not least, Councillor Ms. Adianti. Sardana Rini Virijuda. I hope my pronunciation is correct. Uh, from India, uh, presented us the whole picture and the result of the G20 summit meeting held two weeks ago at Bali. We truly appreciate Indonesian government for the excellent leadership role that is truly required at this precarious geopolitical situation. Terima Kashi. Now, uh, considering the time uh, uh, constraint, now I would like to invite uh, conversations between speakers and audiences. Mm -hmm. To save time, uh, I and uh, some uh, KDI school steps already arranged uh, 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 questions and uh, comments uh, uh, will be given to us by uh, KDI uh, professors, poor professors. So uh, I would like to uh, give my uh, the floor to the uh, Professor Kim Jong first. Professor Kim, over to you. Hi, thank you so much. Can you hear me well? Yes. Oh. Okay, thank you so much for the, all the amazing uh, presentations. And I have specific question to uh, Ambassador Teresa Dubaga about the gender uh, equality mainstreaming issue. So um, I am also very impressed by the Philippines' achievement regarding gender equality, right? And then there are many things that we can learn uh, as a South Korean. But the thing is, you know, it's not just Philippines. South Korea and then you know Afghanistan and the Dominican Republic and then all these countries have made substantial efforts to achieve gender equality. But the thing is, gender equality is not fully achieved. And then I was thinking, then what could be the issue? What is the missing piece? And I think that we are not talking a lot enough about men in this issue. You know, when it comes to gender, it's women and also men's issue, right? Are you agreeing with me? Okay, yay, okay. <laughs> and then I was thinking, in what way the legislative uh, reforms that you mentioned uh, in Philippines can, in a way, uh, you know, promote men's involvement in this gender equality issue? And that's all, thank you. Thank you very much. Hello? C can you hear me there? Okay, thank you. Oh, okay. Thank you. Go on. Thank you very much uh, for your kind words earlier. Uh, 
uh, to uh, Ambassador, uh, our moderator. Thank you very much for that question. Yes, yes, I do. Um, I join the others uh, who raised their hands in in uh, in agreeing with you that yes, um, the viewpoint, the male viewpoint, uh, male inputs. Um, should always be part of, of the equation, should be part of the conversation. Of course, there, there are so many other factors that we need to take into consideration in closing the gender gap. There are social, um, social cultural attitudes, for example. It's, it's much easier, I, I believe, to change the economic framework in a country, for example, or in a community, than it is to change um, social and cultural attitudes. So, so that's one major challenge. Um, but in, in the case of the Philippines, um, our more recent legislation like the Safe Spaces Act, um, like uh, under the, uh, the JEWE, the, uh, the Gender um, and Development um, uh, Work Program that, that we're doing now, uh, specifically brings in um, the other voices um, into the conversation, for example. Um, we've made um, gender and, and development um, retooling, for example, mandatory on the part not just of women in the bureaucracy, but also of men in the bureaucracy, which I think is very important in terms of leveling off expectations and understanding. So I, I think that that has to be a very important starting point. Of course, um, in terms of public and global campaigns, uh, the UN has, has um, its he for she, um, campaign, which um, has its value in terms of, of getting the message out there and bringing um, the men into the conversation. But it also has to be backed up um, in individual countries and in individual communities by providing the infrastructure for more gender responsive um, governance. Um, but, but it can be done. It will take a while. Um, I have many colleagues, since we started instituting um, the mandatory um, gender and development um, retooling and training program in our own ministry, oh, there were, believe me, there were so many complaints that do I have to sit through this? You know, we, we, tried, we, we tried to be as creative as possible. We made it asynchronous learning so people are not forced, you know, hybrid learning, um, and to put in incentives. Um, in, in the early goings, it will take a while. There will be resistance. There always is. Um, you know, change and rethinking, um, rethinking mindsets, it's always a very challenging thing. But once you get it started, then you can at the very least see what works and what doesn't and what has the potential um, to engender um, more conversation and uh, more appreciation from, from uh, from different viewpoints, then, then I think you, you can have something going there. Thank you. Thank uh, Professor Kim and Ambassador Vega. Uh, now I would like to give the floor uh, to uh, Professor uh, chang Ni. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for the uh, uh, impressive uh, presentation. Uh, because we know that uh, digital technologies do not uh, give us only promises, but it gives us challenges as well. And uh, the UN says that India will be the most populous country next year. <laughs> so what India does uh, shows us uh, what we can do and what can work better in, in what circumstances, because India is full of you know, heterogeneity and diversity. So in that regard, I mean, uh, what you uh, told us, like, uh, using uh, natural language processing to uh, bridge the gap between different uh, languages and also improving the financial access of rural uh, people. I mean, these were, uh, I mean, really uh, gave us some kind of hope. And I, uh, so, so I had a, a question about uh, what uh, we can do for the uh, kind of urban poor or those who can't uh, keep up with the ch in changing technological uh, progress. Because I heard that uh, there's an initiative like Code um, Unati or something, I mean, which is a product of private-public uh, partnership to give training to uh, young people so they could learn techniques and set up new uh, firms. But as we all know, uh, people in their 50s, 60s, they, could do, uh, they, they can't do that. So I, I wonder what the Indian government uh, is thinking to uh, engage them a as well. And I have a small question about uh, I mean, uh, any uh, strategic um, uh, initiative uh, for data opening, because the, Kore the Korean government did a lot to open their administrative data so database, 
including national health care and national pension. So this helped uh, many firms to start and utilize the data. Yeah, thank you. Ambassador Kumar, you have the floor. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, thank you. I think that's a that's a very interesting um, question that you have raised, and I have briefly touched upon it in my remarks also. Uh, and it is indeed a broader issue uh, apart from scaling and digital technologies. Uh, when when we look at uh, disruption that will be caused by new and emerging technologies. Um, when we see that there's going to be more and more automation in several sectors, including in manufacturing space, uh, we need to sort of anticipate the requirement for new types of skills. Anticipate, because we don't know what the jobs of the future will look like. Um, but at the basic level, yes, you are right, we need to uh, skill all our population in digital technologies, some basic things. Uh, and as, uh, as you yourself alluded, I think this cannot be done without uh, a public-private partnership model. And so that is what we are trying to do. We are also cognizant of the fact that not everybody has access to physical infrastructure by way of smartphones or, or tablets and so on. And that is why uh, we have embarked on a project to provide common service centers across the country uh, to deal, deal with that uh, situation. Um, but we do believe that uh, adopting digital technologies at scale will help bring in more efficiency it will uh, bring more transparency in in uh, g delivery of government services and the last point that you uh, raised uh, which is uh, again very important uh, should public data held with different government departments be shared for use by civil society or ngos and we, we have um, taken a step in that direction, um, as you would, uh, as one can imagine, these data sets, before they are shared with the third parties, are anonymized, uh, but, but contain useful parameters that can help with um, data analytics or policy formulation and so on. Thank you. Ambassador Kumar, and uh, uh, now is the time for uh, Professor Jin Suli. Uh, thank you for a very informative uh, the presentation on uh, mobilizing investment uh, to achieve uh, uh, SDG. Uh, uh, I think, uh, I, as you point out, uh, we need both public and private investment uh, to achieve SDGs. Uh, so I wonder whether there are areas or roles uh, where the, a public investment works better and or uh, private invest works better. Also, uh, I also wonder uh, uh, what uh, uh, public uh, uh, investment play a role uh, to promote uh, or uh, to, uh, to be a catalyst for a further uh, private investment uh, so that uh, we can work uh, together. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Great question. Um, so I'd say, I mean, <clears throat> as I was talked a bit about, the, the question here is real or perceived risk uh, when you're talking about investment. Uh, and I think the role of public investment is to take the risk in some ways that private won't. In other words, where market fails or where market won't go, uh, then there's an argument that public needs to go uh, in order to, to shift things for the future. Um, and I see and in doing that is not to subsidize necessarily or to replace private sector. The idea is to be that catalyst. As the moderator, uh, I think, adequately or expertly pointed out, the lighthouse, I think, is a very good analogy for what you're trying to do in that sense of public investment. If you can get a blended investment, even better in some senses, so that it's quasi-commercial, quasi-private. But the whole idea for me is you're making investment which catalyzes system change, market system change. Uh, Deputy Ambassador Weir, uh, I remember I participated in many discussions uh, in the OECD uh, DAC uh, committee chaired by uh, uh, Susanna Moorhead. She was uh, so great uh, and, and I have uh, so many uh, uh, beautiful uh, memories uh, from her. 
And uh, uh, now we'll have uh, Professor Wonyeok Lim uh, by uh, Zoom. Uh, very good to see you here. <laughs> good to see you, Ambassador Go. Thank you very much. Uh, I like. I. I. Uh, I'm sorry. I couldn't join you in person due to my prior commitments in uh, Sejong. I, I teach a course on global governance and G20 uh, at KDI School, and I'd like to focus my comment on Councillor Virajuda's excellent presentation. Uh, I thought uh, Councillor Virajuda was being quite modest because I believe. Uh, Indonesia helped to uh, hold the G20 together uh, this year and helped the group to pass its first real geopolitical test. Uh, I mean, we can do a thought experiment in this regard. Uh, suppose the G20 at the leadership level had been established uh, at the same time as the G20 financed, uh, finance ministers meeting in 1999. Uh, Let's just ask ourselves, how would the G20 have handled the uh, U.S. invasion of Iraq in 2003? I mean, whenever a major power gets involved in a major conflict like that, uh, starting with the League of Nations way back when, uh, international community has a big problem. And I, I, I thought that uh, I thought Indonesian presidency did a great job this year uh, issuing uh, the leader's uh, declaration, not just chair's summary. And uh, 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 since this is about uh, global governance and diplomacy, I'd like to uh, really highlight the uh, great diplomatic work uh, that Indonesia performed in this regard, because uh, instead of focusing on the merits and uh, the merits of geopolitical arguments uh, regarding Russia's invasion of Ukraine and subsequent sanctions. I, I think Indonesia was very smart uh, to allow the G20 members to agree to disagree. So as uh, paragraph three uh, mentioned, uh, most members strongly condemn the war in Ukraine, but at the same time, uh, paragraph uh, three included uh, that there were other views and different assessments of the situation and sanctions. And uh, instead, Indonesia focused on two points of general agreement uh, that all members could uh, support uh, with some persuasion. Uh, those two points are the uh, severe economic impact of geopolitical conflicts, you know, uh, on the livelihood of uh, ordinary people, food insecurity, energy insecurity, and so on, which would have negative uh, reputational consequences for great powers. So I thought that was very smart uh, to focus on that. And the other uh, uh, main uh, point was uh, that all members uh, appreciated the value of the multilateral system based on the purposes and principles of the United Nations Charter. So as paragraph four says, you know, it is essential to uphold international law and uh, the multilateral system that safeguards peace and stability. And that paragraph concludes uh, that today's era must not be of war, uh, where uh, Indian Prime Minister Modi had, a, had, had played, a, uh, played an important role as well. So I congratulate Indonesia on uh, this uh, exemplary uh, work. And my question to Councillor uh, Rajuda is, what is Indonesia going to do going forward as the previous uh, president of the G20 supporting India and then uh, Brazil and South Africa after that at the G20? And even outside the G20, what would Indonesia do to uh, reinforce uh, the point about the value of the multilateral system and uh, the value of the United Nations Charter? Thank
Thank you very much, uh, Professor, for, for your question. And I would also like to thank the moderator and the professor for the kind words uh, expressed um, on Indonesia's presidency. It was uh, indeed quite challenging, but we, were, we felt very uh, proud and very, very happy that we were able to uh, successfully pull it off and to uh, achieve the Bali Leaders Declaration, which undoubtedly was um, the, the debate, the discussion to, um, to achieve this document was very, very lengthy. And um, um, I also would like to concur with Professor when um, he said that uh, Indonesia uh, allowed the members to agree to disagree on you know, sensitive issues and at the same time to focus on issues of, uh, of mutual concern and uh, that we can um, concur on and agree on. And uh, turning to the question uh, as uh, posed by Professor, uh, what do we expect uh, going forward? Uh, as I mentioned in my presentation that one of the key successes of the G20 is continuation and in this regard, we hope that um, uh, the upcoming presidency, India, <laughs> will, uh, will, who I am sure will successfully carry on the torch, will um, continue to uh, focus on the key issues. And as Ambassador had mentioned, uh, digital transformation is uh, one of uh, the key issues of India's presidency. So we're very happy to hear that. And, um, of course, uh, it is our hope that, uh, that despite the geopolitical tensions and the looming um, recession, this would not, um, how do you say, uh, get in the way of the G20 cooperation. Because, uh, as I mentioned in the presentation, the G20 is the economic powerhouse and we really, really need to work together to address all these global uh, issues. And the only way to achieve that is by working together, despite the, you know, the differences, uh, in, uh, geo uh, especially geopolitically. And uh, regarding the second question, um, as to how we uh, th seek to work on uh, multilateral cooperation. Uh, also, as I had mentioned in my presentation, um, Indonesia seeks to use um, this approach in uh, a lot of uh, uh, the fora in which Indonesia is a, m a member. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, climate action, uh, we seek to to move this forward in Indonesia's presidency of ASEAN next year. And I'm sure that we will try to, uh, to um, achieve as much as possible during Indonesia's chairmanship of ASEAN and work as hard as we can uh, in a similar manner to what we have done for the G20 presidency. And uh, we hope for the cooperation and uh, from from all other countries in order to achieve this purpose. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. And uh, during uh, our conversation, uh, uh, Dean Liu uh, raised his hand. So yeah, I'll be very brief. Uh, I'd like to uh, congratulate and thank uh, all the panelists for their uh, excellent and very interesting talk. Uh, I have a tiny question for Mr. Weir. Uh, when uh, the development, uh, the Department for International Development uh, was merged into the uh, Foreign and Commonwealth uh, Office two years ago, there were some concerns and even some worries about uh, whether such a move uh, would be detrimental to UK's uh, contributions to development efforts. And uh, more than two years have passed, and uh, I'm wondering uh, what has actually happened in that regard, for better or for worse. 
Um, oh. This work okay. Um, so I think uh, I should I shall have to have to go for lunch with you to tell you the full story uh, of of the uh, of the merger. Uh, as I say, we're two years in, and my my previous job to this was leading the merger. So I have lots of insights that I can share. Uh, I, I mean, it's, it's it was done uh, in strong headwinds, should we say, uh, in terms of uh, odor and uh, sort of UK economy and the the, the, the Ukraine war. Um, so it's been difficult to do a merger um, in the in the global context, if you like. But I still think the ambition um, is is correct in that bringing development into the heart of your foreign policy machine uh, should, will, allow you to do better development. So the ambition when we created the new department that we were going to do development better than DFID and we were going to do foreign policy better than the old Foreign and Commonwealth Office. So the new FCDO would do both tradecrafts, if you like, better by coming together. Now I think it's a bit like the conversation we had before. There's a long journey in terms of cultural changes because you're bringing together two sets of people that speak a different language, have different values, think about the world differently. So it takes quite a long time to get that right, but the ambition is still there. Uh, uh, Deputy Ambassador, uh, now I would like to uh, invite uncoordinated uh, questions. <laughs> Uh, from the floor, uh, please uh, raise your hand. Okay. Uh, uh. Uh, thank you. Good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Pleasure of being here. This is Alanda Ahmadzai from Afghanistan. M my question is referring to the ambassador of uh, Philippines regarding the good governance. How you evaluate the reform of gender responsive budgeting and good governance? Because as per the UN, initiatives in 2001, Philippines were one of the success story for implementing the GDP, G GRB initiatives. And the second question is referring to the uh, deputy head of mission, British Embassy, how you evaluate the DFID program impact on the developing countries and is it involved in the British inv international investment uh, new program as well? Thank you. Uh Yes, uh, thank you very much for that question. In, in the case of the Philippines, um, it, took, it took some time for us um, to look at um, gender program audit as an essential element in getting um, you know, gender responsive governance to work. Um, initially, as I think would be the case in, in some other countries, the tendency is to really focus on plans and programs. Um, without, uh, without a very effective or efficient audit um, arm, but we've uh, hopefully we were over that hump, and now we have instituted um, a gender and development audit, um, and it's 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 a it's a, it's through all levels of governance, from uh, from the senior management um, level down to um, the front line and the grassroots level. So I think that it's very important to have that in place. It will take a while to build the system together, but once it's in place, then you can plan more effectively. You can see, as I mentioned earlier, what works, what doesn't. More importantly, what's needed. Um, within the overall f development framework um, that you're working towards and the results that you want to achieve. So I think it's very important when you go into gender um, and development, mainstreaming and gender responsive governance, that there's a very strong um, audit program. Actually, we were just audited last week on our gender and development um, performance here at POST. Um, and it's it's a rather tedious process, but, but it all starts at um, at the very base, at the planning stage. At the planning stage, you're already given the tools so that when the audit time comes, it's quite systematic, it's, it's scientific even. You can go both into quantitative and qualitative um, audit of your program. So I think to make it really work, you need to think of, of the audit portion. You need, and we, we just have to take it seriously and, and to approach it in a very systematic manner. Thank you. Ambassador, next question and questions. Yeah. Hello, everyone. My name is Vic June, Excel Wuta. And 
I really don't have questions. I think I just want to express my opinion on what I think about the whole gender thing um, as it relates to the question the professor asked. I think there has been, um, over the years, there has been um, oversight when it comes to um, policies. My, um, my attention has been drawn to the institutional side of your topic. Um, the policies mainly that have been um, made and implemented, they're mostly by men. So the, by oversight, I mean um, they don't necessarily consider how the woman's body was made in terms of birth, in, in terms of period, and all of that. That's why I really think um, women empowerment is very key, especially in um, education. So in education, I think we should start from the high school level, which I think is the foundation, because an empowered woman is free from servitude. So in in school, um, in high schools, I really do think um, school going girls, especially when it comes to period poverty, it is something I think we just talk about. Um, menstrual health day comes May 28 every year. We celebrate and take around sanitary pads. For me, I think any period poverty goes beyond just the distribution and provision of sanitary pads. It also should consider the well-being of the girl child in terms of her health and all of that. I remember growing up, um, when I started seeing my period media, I really used to suffer from excruciating pain. And there was no policy in school that at least I should be given a day off or two to get better and return to school. So I had to stay in class. On t I wasn't really paying attention, but because I had to stay in class, I was just there. So I think we should have policy in place that allow school-going girls to have a day or two off because the first two days of menstruation can be very painful. And maybe we should have a gender desk at schools as well that address the issue of harassment, the issue of rape, abuse, and other things. Um, secondly, Women are just put in place. I think they're just, I think, society kind of thing when they give, when a woman occupies a space at a first or second or third position, she should be grateful for it. I think a woman's right is not a privilege. She should be any, she should just be in positions to um, fulfill her potential in everything. So in politics, you find out political parties who establish women wings and decide that it's just for women only and they leave the important positions for the men. I think it's something we also should look at. And then um, lastly, okay, one example. In my country, maternal leave is like two months, uh, three months. So I wanted to go beyond that because Three months is not enough for a woman to get back her body and be physically able and mentally able to go back to work. I think it should go beyond three months and maybe with flexible work schedules. Um, lastly, talking about getting men involved, I think we should get them involved and included by having seminars for men. It's time we have seminars for men and tell them how we think or how we want the whole partnership about gender equality, working alongside the men 50-50 and all of that to be. Because they don't know, I mean, a man cannot make a decision about my body. I think I should be able to say if you're in this position, you should consider that this happens to me and when you're making policies, you should please highlight this. That's my view. Ambassador Pega, you are very popular today. <laughs> And, and, and there, uh -huh. uh, yeah, I can. Um, so I can come. But I mean, so first, just to start with that. So thank you for sharing very passionately uh, your your thoughts and ideas and your experience. And just to reflect on something um, in the UK that's changed in my generation um, is shared parental leave, and this has really changed the conversation in the UK. So it used to be called maternity leave. The expectation was that the mother would take you know nine months off. And now it's shared parental leave. And, and so in many ways, I'm a bit frustrated I didn't do this uh, because, it's much, because now a lot of my younger friends who have children share. So, you know, the woman does the first three months and the man then takes over for three months and then they both have some time off together. And it changes the dialogue around roles as, a, you know, who, who's expected to do what in work and, and, and family. So I think just structurally, there are things we do, could do which change the conversation. Uh, and then just to answer the question from the lady in Afghanistan was there are basically two metrics that we look at for, for DFIs. And one, one is the impact it has. So we measure that by jobs and tax and private sector it mobilizes. And the second is that it's sustainable, i.e. financially sustainable. It needs to cover its cost. 
In other words, we give them money and they need to make sure they make enough money to cover the cost of running it, but they have no expectation of making a return. Would you like to add some? No? Okay, go on. Maybe Ambassador, just, just to comment on, on, the, um, on the lady's um, comment earlier, very, very um, passionate and I do agree with all your points. Um, in the case of the Philippines, um, the legislation um, was not wholly crafted by, by men. We were very fortunate in that a lot of um, uh, you know, very uh, visionary women um, leaders and experts um, had a say in, in the crack crafting of, of gender responsive legislation but legislation is it's it's a long process there's research involved there's um, a lot of negotiation involved before you get laws passed and and of course the implementation um, stage is something else so so there has to be a very strong partnership there um, for for each to reach you know um, you know a, a you know, some, some synergy and, and some understanding that this is what we need to do and this is what we have to do and this is how we'll do it. So I think it's very important. But thank you very much for your comments. Thank you. Okay. Oh. Oh, I think uh, maybe someone uh, raised the hand. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, okay, go on. Okay, thank you very much. My name is Maurice Sion, and I come from Liberia. Uh, my question goes to the Ambassador of India. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, I'd like to know, as a member of the developing country, uh, what is on the agenda, or what is in the parcel for the India's presidency for the G20 summit next year, uh, taking into account that uh, India is a developing country. But uh, when we talk about digitalization, it mainly uh, benefits developed countries. So aside from uh, the digitalization you are talking about in the India's presidency, what is key in the pipeline that you think that could be discussed that would be beneficiary for developing countries. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for your question. Uh, I think I will... Uh, I think uh, we are going to assume presidency on 1st of December and our leadership is going to actually formally outline our positions on that day, so I, I don't want to uh, say anything to uh, preempt our leadership, <laughs> but uh, I can tell you that uh, we are a strong proponent of um, sharing our perspective as a developing country on some of the cross-cutting issues. And I have shared my perspectives on uh, on data today, but there are many many issues. Like if you look at global health, for example, um, there are historically less investment into research and development for diseases of the tropical or the south. And th those are the type of issues that we would seek to, uh, to, uh, to take up. Uh, climate change is an another big issue, uh, and uh, that will be taken up. Uh, mitigation, adaptation, financing for the developing world. We did have a uh, agreement on the most vulnerable at the uh, COP summit in Egypt. Uh, so, so we will bring in our perspective, of course, uh, since we are the most populous country, we uh, have taken uh, different approaches to some of the issues uh, that we all face, but uh, we, we want uh, to use the G20 forum to also share, up, uh, share these perspectives and plus need to build up, build up on what the Indonesian presidency has achieved uh, and my congratulations with them on a successful summit. Uh, and take those outcomes forward. Thank you. Uh, the great uh, questions, comments, and responses. Uh, and I think it is the right time to close uh, this uh, discussion. 
And I do think that uh, all of these four speakers are deserved to have big hands. Don't you agree? <laughs> Thank you very much once again to our wonderful speakers and moderator and to our audience, um, all of you joining via YouTube as well. This actually concludes uh, the Global Governance and Diplomacy Workshop. Um, we were very glad to have you all here today and we hope to see you going forward and we, uh, it, uh, we would like to inaugurate this as a regular event. So please stay tuned. And once again, the, please fill out the survey and leave it at your, your place setting. Thank you so much. Have a good afternoon. Thank you.